thoughts about him back. The guy, other guy that they might consider would be the tight end LaFleur. He likes his size, but I think right now he's thinking defensive line, and I think that player would be Ronaldo Wynn. Yeah, that's the way we had it, Andrea, one, two. Let's go to the pick a minute, a minute ago uh, by Minnesota, Dwayne Rudd. They're thinking on that? Well, the top players that they wanted were gone. The receivers and cornerbacks were both gone. Now, you guys were talking about Ray Carruth. I do not think that they were very high on him. He is slipping. We've been talking about that already. They just, they just were not pleased with him, certainly enough not to take him. They feel that with Rudd, he's got versatility, that he can play all three positions. Remember, Eddie McDaniel is coming back from knee surgery. Dixon Edwards had nicked up at the end of the season. Players are getting older. They feel that there's not the pressure that they would have to get right in there, but they definitely like his versatility, Chris. All right, Andrea, thank you. Jacksonville has made their selection, so we think win one, LaFleur two. Pick us on the way up with Philadelphia and Buffalo, the next two on the clock. This is the 21st selection. Pick us in. We just get a roar out of the crowd. It's hard to tell what things going on behind us, but... Uh, it was for a while a circus atmosphere here, but now the New York teams have made their picks a little bit more quiet. Let's go back up to the podium. With the uh, 21st pick in the first round, the Jacksonville Jaguars select Ronaldo Wynn, defensive tackle Notre Dame. The Philadelphia Eagles are now on the clock. Well, we know Joe's excited with the gold domer in Finally. the first round, and we know that uh, Tom Jackson really likes uh, Ronaldo Wynn. Time for another demonstration. What does he do a little different than the guys that have just gone uh, a few picks ahead on the defensive front, Tommy? Well, Chris, I thought that Ronaldo Wynn was the best combination defensive end, defensive tackle in the draft, and he was the quickest guy that I saw off the football. You take a look at him in action, you see him legitimately beat the double team. He has a low center of gravity. Now, remind yourself that this guy weighs 288 pounds, even though he wears number 48. You see him get the pin. Look at the outside move right there, gets the arm, and the closing speed. He does not look like a guy who's 6'3", 288, but when you consider the fact that he runs a 4'7", 4'4", it causes for a lot of impact. This is a guy who knows where the collisions are going to take place, and he's going to be there when they happen. All right, Tommy G did that without Sterling there, too. He left you alone finally. We're going to uh, be back with the Eagles, Bills, Steelers, and Cowboys. That'll take up a good part of the next half hour or so. Stick around. Water up, please. America's favorite neighbor, Applebee's, introduces new skillet sensations. From the spice of New Orleans to the sizzle of Sicily. From chicken to shrimp. From start to finish. Right now, everything at Applebee's sounds sizzling good. You belong at Applebee's. Oh, yeah. You belong at Applebee's. But after a visit to Hoffman's Collision Centers, it looks new. At and we employ specially trained technicians and use the collision sense of first time. Put your trust in Hoffman's collision Gordon finished first at the Daytona 500. Maybe it was luck. And maybe when Quaker State teammate Terry Labonte came in second, it was just another good day at the track. But with Quaker State's Ricky Craven coming in third, you just have to wonder, is there something special in this team's blood or in their engines? Quaker State, the quality the Hendricks Racing Team demands, the quality your car deserves. Quaker State. A clean sweep at Daytona. Unleash the beast. Unleash the beast. Yeah! He's master. This is the sound of small businesses doing more business with Fridays free from Sprint. Call now, and your business can get long distance on Fridays free until the year 2000. Call 1-800-598-5000, only from Sprint. Linebacker, Dallas Cowboys. They earlier, remember, signed Dallas's kicker, Chris Boniel, so maybe they're, they're trying to enlist some Dallas North for them. They, In case you missed it late uh, or in the middle of the week, uh, William Fuller, the Fuller Rush man, who had a marvelous season for the Eagles last year, defensive end. They lost him, signed by the San Diego Chargers. So that's a little plus and minus with the Eagles. Now with Fuller gone, I mean, he was he was mammoth for them last year. He too. was, especially you consider the fact that Andy Harmon, Red Hall, both of them injured a little bit coming back. I mean, Mike Mamula is smallish on the other side. 
Uh, Fuller was really the big guy in the middle. I still think they go this way. I think Trevor Price is, is a very viable alternative here. I think you need a defensive lineman. That would be the area that they'd have to look at. I mean, their defensive line produced very few sacks. Mamula, a sacking specialist. Hall only one. Harmon only one. Greg Jefferson only one. And Hollis, I mean, that's all you that, that he has left. I think there's a very good opportunity to get some quality in the defensive line here for him. If we go Trevor Price, is he the next guy, and is that a little bit of a reach at this spot, in your opinion, Mel? I don't think so, Chris, because a lot of teams really slotted him in this area. He's 280 pounds, but he plays very high. Comparisons from drawn to Alfonso Carriker, uh, the former Packer out of Florida State. We look at defensive linemen. I like Wiley. I think he'll be a steal for somebody. Then you get down to Trevor Price, the next best defensive end. Now, there are some defensive tackles. One guy that some people thought could go in this area was Rick Taylor. Terry, a 300-pounder from North Carolina. So Rick Terry of North Carolina, Trevor Price, I think they certainly have to go defensive line based on Fuller's loss and also not getting Farrah Collins. They gave him a, a contract situation, didn't get it done. New England re-signed them. So certainly a defensive line need. I think I think either Price or Rick Terry. And the Eagles need some size. There's yeah. no question they need a little bit of size. So we'll see. The Eagles have about nine minutes to go on their selection. We are in the final third of the first round here in New York. Looking for a smart way to earn up to $40,000 for college? Call 1-800-USA-ARMY and ask how to qualify for the Montgomery GI Bill plus the Army College Fund. Now, $40,000 for college. If your parents can't afford $40,000 for college, ask your uncle. The Montgomery GI Bill plus the Army College Fund. Now, $40,000 for college. Call your recruiter to find out how to qualify. You're the greatest. Oh, thanks. Take a check. Sure, Daffy. Just need some ID. Are you serious? How many big cartoon stars come into the Checks are a pain, but your bank has a better way, the Visa check card. And if your ATM card has a Visa logo on it, you've got one. It automatically deducts from your checking account everywhere Visa's accepted. You're despicable. Visa check card works just like a check, only better. What am I wrong? Tonight, Mario Lemieux and the Penguins trail the series 1-0 as they look to square things up with the Legion of Doom. Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, tonight at 7.30. The Stanley Cup playoffs on ESPN. Lindros looks tough. Let's Let's get his prints. How I spent my summer vacation by Matthew. For summer vacation, I usually get sunburned at the beach, get poison ivy camping out, or have to pose for silly pictures with a giant cartoon. But this summer, Mom and Dad let me have the time of my life at race camp. I got to spend six days at the Atlanta Motor Speedway living and learning just like a member of a real race team. At race camp, I learned about things like aerodynamics, suspensions, and how engines work. But the coolest part was I got to drive a half-scale race car and learn what it's like to be a real race driver. I even slept in a dorm that used to be the race car garage. I got to do things I never dreamed of at race camp. Race Camp is a hands-on learning experience for kids aged 10 to 17 with sessions running every week during June, July, and August. For more information, call toll-free 1-888-RACE-KID today. Race Camp, not your same old summer camp. It's not that great. I mean, a 24-hour sports news network? Yeah, sure. Scores, highlights, breaking news. Who cares? Big deal. People act like this is a second coming or something. People say, are you going to be on ESPN News? Nope. No way. Apparently, I don't fit into their little schedule. I need a new agent. This ESPN special, the 1997 NFL Draft, is brought to you by the U.S. Army. Be a part of the toughest, smartest army in the world. Be all that you can be. And by Visa, the preferred card of the NFL. It's everywhere you want to be. Hey, go on what? Was amazing. We are back in New York, and we just mentioned that the Eagles had signed a couple of players uh, from the Dallas Cowboys in this past season, including Darren Smith just uh, yesterday or today. Uh, they've also now made a trade with the Dallas Cowboys. The Cowboys, and we'll get you details of the trade in a moment, the Cowboys have now moved up in this slot. They have five and a half minutes to make a pick. Uh, they move up three spots from the 25 slot. 
Is it to take a receiver or a tight end? Let's quickly go up to Chris Fowler. Chris? What's going on, Chris? Uh, trading within the division, right, all the old rules are, are being broken, but the Cowboys, we talked about it, their offense really built on the wide receiver position and the need to stretch defenses and create a, a threat with speed at wide receiver. Ray Carruth, we've talked a lot about him, even though his name has not been called to the podium in New York as perhaps the slider in round one. Just talked to Ray out in Sacramento a couple of minutes ago. He is not that concerned yet. He says really the upside of being drafted later in the first round, sure it costs you some money, but there is the chance to play for a better football team, the kind of teams that draft right now. But I think he's going to start to get nervous if the Cowboys don't use this pick to take him or the Steelers don't use their pick coming up in a few spots to take him. Right now he says he's calm, but he just wants to get the pick over with it and go for a walk. It's a tense time for these guys who are not drafted when their agents told them they're going to be drafted and when the teams told them they're going to be drafted, Chris. No, no question about it, Chris, but they'll have their opportunity eventually, just not where they thought. Let's quickly uh, go to Sal Palantonio, who is at Giants headquarters, but a uh, Philadelphia Maven. What, whatever happened to the days of Buddy Ryan going after the Dallas kicker? I mean, the Dallas and Philadelphia making a swap, and why would Philly bail out here, Sal? Yeah, instead of going bounty hunting, they're trading up for picks, trading down for picks. The Eagles were probably sweating it out that Ronaldo Wynn would be taken. Certainly they were sweating it out that Kenny Holmes would be taken before them. Kennard Lang was someone they liked, Renard Wilson. All of them were off the board when they picked, so it's natural to go down and probably still get a Trevor Price, as Mel Kuyper talked about, or a Rick Terry. Those two picks will probably be there when they pick later on, Chris. All right, Sal, so we shall see. Here's the trade now. So to go up three spots on the trade with the Eagles, uh, the Cowboys give up a fifth round pick and a third round pick uh, next year. So I, not bad for a three slot move. But what do make you make any sense? What do they want? But that's the thing. What what goes here? It, Carruth is going to be there. Certainly, uh, certainly Buffalo isn't going to take a wide receiver. I doubt if Pittsburgh is. So I mean, you're in a situation where it's you know maybe it's defensive line. You know, Leon Lett's going to be gone for at least 12 weeks. So uh, and and they haven't got a lot of production out of that. I think if Troy Aikman has the say that everybody has, I think that a wide receiver certainly is the guy that you're looking for. Let's go down a big D and see if Chris Myers has an ear into the war room. Chris. Well, the Cowboys are trying to iron out exactly in which direction they're going to go. It looks like David LaFleur, the tight end out of LSU, is uh, the way the Cowboys are going to choose. Uh, Troy Aikman did work out. Players like LaFleur, Tony Gonzalez, and Ike Hilliard, and liked all of them. LaFleur, 6'7", a big tight end who fits into the Dallas Cowboy needs. As Larry Lacewell, the director of scouting, told me, he said, we need two tight ends in this offense. We've got to have two tight ends. And Eric Bjornsson has done a good job, but has been often injured. And that put a lot of pressure on Troy Aikman on the Dallas offense. Offense. Troy Aikman did indicate to me within the last week that he cannot count on Jay Novacek. And uh, in all reality, the Novacek is out of the picture for the Cowboys in the future. So Dallas going after David LaFleur, the tight end from LSU. We'll have more from the War Room in Dallas. We'll talk with Jerry Jones in a few minutes here. Let's go back to Chris Berman in New York. All right, Chris, thank you. The pick is in uh, here in New York. And uh, of course, Novacek's been such an un, well, not unheralded because he's a Pro Bowl player, such a go to guy. For Troy Aikman through the years, could it be tight end? That's what we think, obviously. With the uh, 22nd pick just acquired from Philadelphia, the Dallas Cowboys select David LaFleur, tight end from LSU. I like it. Why trade up, Joe? No, I, I'll tell Buffalo you what, Bills I, are now on the clock. I, I think that. Buffalo's not taking them. San Francisco is a viable, I think San Francisco was a possibility, maybe as somebody wanting to take a tight end. The reason why I like this pick is Dallas, first of all, can use the tight end to help in their running game. It gives them more size in the running game. Bjornsson did a pretty good job filling in for Novacek last year, so you've got your move tight end, your third down guy. I think this move is made, as was pointed out by Larry Lacewell. You need two tight ends in the Dallas offense. This kid here gives you a viable receiving target, but also a big blocker on the front line. They, the way the offense is run in Dallas is you run with Emmett Smith, you make big plays down the field, and you control third downs by throwing the ball to another tight end. 
again. LaFleur gives them a good blocker and an alternative in the passing game. I think they're okay. I don't. I, I think maybe San Francisco scared them here a little bit. Maybe, John. They had an interesting Gonzalez. I like David LaFleur, 6'7", 280 pounds, but the trade up, we knew that Buffalo wasn't going to take LaFleur. Pittsburgh wasn't. Maybe they were afraid of somebody else, but uh, they do get a good football player. LaFleur, 6'7", as I said, 280 pounds, an extension of your offensive line. He wasn't really utilized at LSU like you would expect because the quarterback play was so questionable. Well, I think when Jacksonville didn't take LaFleur, that's what's triggered this whole thing. Right. No I think question. that's when the move no made. Uh, that, that's the way the whole thing went. I mean, if it doesn't work there, he can even be a tackle. Although, uh, the coach got freed. I mean, for a guy that size, well, I heard the name Dave Casper thrown around when the, one of the scouts was telling me about LaFleur. And if, they're, if that name is in the same sentence, then LaFleur must be a pretty good ball player. Well, Mike, he's got, he's got almost tackle size. He'd be the best catching tackle in the history of football. What about him as a tight end, though? Do big tight ends like him succeed that often? Well, they're, they're a question mark, but when you look at David LaFleur, Chris is right. There are a lot of people that think maybe he can be a left tackle also, but let's take a look at him as a tight end for LSU. You get a player on the in line of scrimmage, he's not a move guy. He's not going to move around a lot. Releases off the line of scrimmage, handover, a big target for your quarterback, big powerful target. He has versatility. You're going to see on this play, Chris, where a football player, he falls down, He's down right now, gets right back off the ground, so he's an athlete, so he's able to, to get back up. He's a position blocker. When you're six foot seven, you block the vision of the defender. When you're blocking a toss sweep or you're turning out on an outside linebacker, you hurt the vision of the defensive lineman too. But so that means Freddie Jones from North Carolina, that if, if there's a run on tight ends, he's the next one. I know he's the guy you like very much. Yeah, I really like him. LaFleur, a hunter, a fisherman, loves the outdoors so he can hang out with Troy Aikman, and you know they talk some hunting and fishing as he, as he worked him out. What about LaFleur in the Dallas system? Well, it's a fine pick. Let's be realistic. The Cowboys struggled last year because Jay Novacek was out. Uh, he was always Troy Aikman's go-to receiver. And in that Dallas offensive scheme, a timing and rhythm passing scheme, it starts with the hash area. And we'll take a look right here what they like to do. They like to attack this area of the field, as I just said, the hash area. Uh, in their timing and rhythm passing game, Aikman will set at five steps, right in that pocket at two seconds. Everyone knows they, the Cowboys love to run the skinny post. Post. 12 yards, break to the post, 12 yards, break into the post. If Troy is set back here and doesn't have either of these receivers, he loves to come right back in here to the tight end quickly in 2.1 to 2.2 seconds. He needs the tight end as a go-to guy. I think LeFleur solves one of their problems. David will be happy of the fact Dallas not too far from his home state of Louisiana. He just loved LSU football, grew up worshiping the Tigers, was part of a rebuilding program. They were a terrible team when he went to LSU to play football. Dallas, not in a in terrible situation like that, but he certainly can be part of their rebuilding process. Chris? All right, guys, thank you very much. So, uh, LaFleur goes to the Cowboys. Last time the Cowboys took a, a tight end in the first round, 1973, Billy Joe Dupre. The Buffalo Bills are up next. We have an educated guess at who <laughs> that might be. We'll do that when we come back. made up of many types of fungus that eat your feet alive. But there's a potent weapon that doesn't just cure some, it kills them all. Lotrimin AF, the killer cure. Lotrimin AF, the brand doctors recommend most. Full prescription strength medicine, Lotrimin AF is so powerful, it doesn't just kill some causes, it kills them all. Lotrimin AF, the killer cure. Ten years ago, one school system chose a smarter way to lower costs, lower energy rates. If the child is cold, if they're not comfortable, then they may shut down. Every dollar we drive out of the cost of operations goes back into the classroom. With Enron, we have saved $3 million or more. For us, it is more than energy. It's a sense of well-being. In Columbus, lower energy rates are saving more than money. What can we help you save? Enron. A duck walked into a market to buy some lip balm. 
Night after night, these guys take a lot of abuse. Lost in space. But not as much as this wall. That's why it's been painted with Sherwin-Williams Everclean, a truly washable flat latex. If Everclean can handle this abuse, imagine how well it will work on your walls. Save $4 on Everclean and register to win during our inside-outside sweepstakes. You guys are a great crowd. Then again, to me, a great crowd's a crowd that doesn't throw very hard. Your Sherwin-Williams store. Where to get it? Commissioner Paul Tanglebue waiting for the card from the Buffalo Bills, but let me fill it out. All right, we are we're, the Bills have about nine minutes to go on the clock with the uh, first pick, and the times are changing a little bit in Buffalo with Jim Kelly retired, Kent Hull retired at the center, two glorious players from their four Super Bowl teams, but they still have Thurman Thomas. So why would you say would they get another running back? Well, they're gonna have to win low-scoring football games. Thurman has, says he wants to play two more years. It could only be one, but he's still there. They have a question on the line. They have Derek Holmes, who had a good rookie year last year, not so much. But yet, I'm going to go to a big back. They've got to win ball control games with either Collins or Holbert at quarterback. And I'm going to try Antoine Smith. Very big running back. Did you Houston, 6'2", 223. I heard it from a cab driver in Buffalo. Well, I was just going to say, I find it so interesting. I'm going to go with the big back. I like this guy. I'm wondering who's making this pick. This cab driver, I, I well, I'm not making it. You know, pick. this is the second year this cab driver has been uh, done a very good job. They got some really good cab drivers up there that yeah, know what's they going know, on. They know their way on the New York State Thruway. They, they know their way to Niagara Falls. And, and they know their football up there. Well, I, I would be, I would be, there, there's a couple other things that they could do, but they are now going to try and win with an outstanding defense, with still Bruce Smith and still Chris Spielman and Hanson, who had such a big year, et cetera, et cetera. Low scoring, like when they first became a very good team in 1988. People forget it was defense that carried them. Thurman Thomas's rookie year, it was Art Still and Fred Smurlis and a young Cornelius Bennett and a younger Darrell Talley, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Low scoring, 20 to 17, 17, 14 games, move the ball. So we take a look at uh, well, we take a look at Thurman Thomas's numbers before, and there he is, rushes. I remember when he went in the second round, he was our bubble player. Remember he that? He was asleep. 1988. <laughs> remember he was Waiting sleeping. for the pick. And we hear Chris Fowler talk about Ray Carruth and some others. Sometimes you can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you can get what you need. And for a second round pick at that time by Bill Poley and company, what a great pick he was. So, given that they have Thomas for this year and... Derek Holmes, would you be surprised to see them pick running back? No, not at all. I think when you look at Antoine Smith, I think you're looking at a big kid who has game-breaking ability, and it's rare that you see a kid who's tall, 6'2 and a half, 223 pounds, who can get down the field and make people miss, and he's explosive, and I think he caught the ball better this year for the University of Houston. I think if you look at his all-around game, he was the reason that Kim Helton's club made it to the Liberty Bowl and had a really a turnaround season for the Houston Cougar program. You see the productivity? He missed even a little bit of playing time with some minor injuries. They played through those bumps and bruises. You watch him here. You see the outside speed, the quickness. Look at the exhilaration and the power for a big man. And then the breakaway speed. That's against USC, a pretty good football team. Here it is against Syracuse, another good football team in their bowl game, showing that game-breaking ability. Some shake-and-bake skills for a big 223-pounder. Sure, he's a little overage, but I tell you, he doesn't have a lot of tread on those tires. He only had the one-year former Juco transfer. So I like the productivity this season. You see the yards per carry average up to 6.1 and the touchdowns, 15 this year. So stay healthy, Antoine Smith, and you can have a great pro career in Buffalo. He's big on the size of Eddie George. He's 24, yeah. 25 years old, which is unusual. You figure, were there problems? No, not at all. Uh, he was raised in a trailer by his grandma. Uh, he, he took a couple years off to take care of his younger brother. He's a man that understands some things. He's a man, really. He really is. He's a man which, which helps from a maturity standpoint. You know you're getting a, a finished product. You know you're not going to have to deal with some of the problems you get with the rookies. A couple other factors. Uh, Dan Henning takes over as the offensive coordinator up there. Dan was my coach with the Redskins for a while. He likes the big back. He likes to be able to run the football. The other thing is I got to believe that the Buffalo Bills looked at the Jacksonville Jaguar game from last year, saw what Natron Means did, how a big back could control the game for him. They haven't had the big back control the game. It was done by Jim Kelly and the K gun and Thurman Thomas coming out of the backfield and with the ball in the air. I think what they saw in that playoff, they said, hey, look, we got to go back to running the football. Plus, it plays into a weather situation, mm -hmm. Chris. You want to run the football in Buffalo late if you want to keep the games close and control it. I think it would be a very good pick for you. Well, no, not for me. I just, mean, I'm I, just I, saying, I, for you. That cab driver. You meaning the Buffalo Bills in general, for you. Well, they have, a, they have an interesting competition at quarterback. The youngster, Todd yep. Collins, 
and they trade in the offseason for Billy Joe Holbert. It'll be an open competition. I think if they start today, it's Collins, but that's why they have training camp. The pick is coming in, so we will see if that cabbie uh, gets his fare. <laughs> And after Buffalo, it's Pittsburgh, Philadelphia now, and San Francisco. So the Bills with the 23 pick after a disappointing exit from the playoffs last year at home. Their only home playoff loss ever at Rich Stadium uh, to the Jacksonville Jaguars. With the uh, 23rd pick in the first round, the Buffalo Bills select Antoine Smith, running back from the University of Houston. This year, you know, Thurman, of course, will the uh, Pittsburgh as as Steelers can, are now on the but clock. Holmes or Smith will sit. But if Thurman Thomas is going to play only one year more, and certainly in Buffalo, they they hope not, but only one year more, then he becomes, at least in the Bills' plans, the bread and butter back who can carry 25 times in the wind and the dank of Rich Stadium in Orchard Park, New York. We'll be back with the Steelers. Nobody's tougher on cars than a police force. As a result, nobody's tougher on motor oil either. The extreme stress and searing heat generated by their hard driving can break down an oil in no time. That's why the Kansas City Police use Castrol GTX, the only leading 10W30 that provides maximum protection against both viscosity and thermal breakdown. Because some people have more important things to worry about than motor oil. Castrol GTX. Drive hard. It now appears that Shaq is suffering from a neck injury. Of course we're concerned. That's one valuable neck. Shaq is suffering from taco neck syndrome, TNS. It's caused by his craving for delicious Taco Bell tacos. And he's getting worse with every neck-bending bite. There's nothing funny about TNS. It's not natural. It's a conspiracy, man. Get some more of those tacos. Six months is a long time. I wish I could take you with me. Yeah, me too. Oh. oh please, for me, all right? For the plane ride? Smile. You love her? Oui? Ah, uh, what's my sister? She's sick. Oh. Very sick. Polaroid. See what develops. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Mel King. I'm Bobby Haynes. And I'm Richard Johnson. And we each own a McDonald's. And we know that people come in all sizes. That's why you can get my size meals at breakfast. Just buy any drink, any coffee, any orange juice, any soft drink, any drink, any size, and hash browns. And get one of four breakfast sandwiches like sausage biscuit with egg for just 55 cents. 55 salutes the year it all began. For my size meals, come to my McDonald's. No, my McDonald's. No, my McDonald's. <laughs> come to any McDonald's. Welcome back. We're into hour number five of ESPN's NFL draft coverage. And one of the stories so far has been players from the three Florida schools, Florida State, Miami, and Florida, have all won national championships in the 90s. And here's a scoop for you. You win titles with good players. The NFL wants good players. The scoreboard, Florida State four, Miami three, the University of Florida two so far through the first 23 picks. Baltimore Ravens select Peter Bolware, defensive end, Florida State. The Seattle Seahawks select Walter Jones, offensive tackle from Florida State. And the New York Giants select Ike Hilliard, yep. wide receiver from Florida. And Tampa Bay selects Warwick Dunn, Ooh. running back, Florida State. And Bengals select Raynard Wilson, linebacker from Florida State. Miami Dolphins select Yatiel Green, wide receiver from the University of Miami. <laughs> the Tampa Bay Buccaneers select Redell Anthony, wide receiver okay. from the University of Florida. And the Washington Redskins select Kennard Lang, defensive end, University of Miami. <laughs> Houston, with a pick from Kansas City, selects Kenny Holmes, defensive end from Miami. So nine of the first 18 picks, half of the first 18 from the guys from the three 
Florida schools who won championships. Most of those guys were born and grew up in the state of Florida as well, Mike. Chris, it shouldn't surprise anybody because when you look, there's 85% of Miami's football team, Florida State's football team, and Florida's football team are homegrown. They're from the state of Florida. Then another 150 players sign with Division I teams. So everybody goes to recruit the state of Florida because of speed, speed, speed. And when you look at these wide receivers being picked today, I kill your Redell Anthony. Remember one thing. Now, I don't argue much with Mel because Mel works hard at it, but I do take an argument with him on Danny Werfel. There's somebody throwing that football. That's a pretty good quarterback that somebody's going to pick up today and he's going to be a good player in the NFL. You think Danny Werfel will go today in the first three rounds? Well, that I would be a surprise I'll, to I'll most people. I'll tell you people. this, Chris. If he doesn't, it, it, I think this guy is productive. He's a winner. I don't care how he throws the ball. It gets there and, and he's successful productive beyond belief. He ends his career as the most efficient quarterback in college football history. You know about all the records. You know about all the awards. He won every quarterback award, about every scholar athlete award you can win. Charlie Ward, another Heisman Trophy winner, back in 93, of course, was not drafted as a quarterback out of Florida State, but of course he declared his interest in playing in the NBA, and that scared off many teams. Danny Werfel, basketball is certainly not a factor for him. We wish him well, although it would be a surprise to just about everybody if he went today in the first three rounds. Well, the Steelers are on the clock, and the former Steeler quarterback, Mark Malone, has more on that. Mark? Well, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, there's no secret here for the Steelers. They have many needs, especially on the defensive side of the football. The loss to free agency of uh, cornerback Deion Figures and Willie Williams, their top two out of three cover corners to free agency leaves them very thin. And when you look so far in the first round, only four cover corners have gone. In fact, Take a look at this right here. Rod Woodson, an unrestricted free agent. Carnell Lake and Perry, they're solid at safety. J.B. Brown was the offseason acquisition. An older player, the Steelers admit to me, that in fact this guy is probably their number two slash three cover corner. So they're probably looking at corners. And as I was saying, if you look at the board, there's a lot of guys left and some big guys out there too. Guys like Kim Herring, Chad Scott, Sam Madison. I would expect one of these guys is going to get picked by the Steelers. Chris? Mark, despite the run on defensive backs, if there are some guys that the Steelers like at that position, that would seem to be a likely pick. Back to New York now and Chris Berman. All right, Chris, thank you. The pick is in for the Steelers. And uh, let's go up to the podium with the commission. That's it. With the uh, 24th pick in the first round, the Pittsburgh Steelers select Chad Scott, defensive back from the University of Maryland. Thank you. Philadelphia well, is now on the clock. Mel, he's uh, from your own backyard. He is. He went to Towson State the first two years, played some free safety, transferred over to Maryland, spent two years for the Terrapins, did a great job. He's six foot one. He's 203 pounds. Tough kid. Gives you a lot of versatility. You watch him here against Harvey Middleton. Guy comes off of Middleton, makes the play. Very instinctive football player. You know, people say he doesn't have the recovery speed to play corner, but he's so tough and he has a, such a feel for the position that you don't necessarily need that great recovery speed and that computer 40 time to get the job done. He has great hands for the interception. Was a big play man. Will support the run. Will hit you and has good ball skills. And I think Chad Scott, for being 6'1", 203, with a lot of big receivers in the National Football League. He'll match up very well and help to lessen that loss of all those free agents that the Steelers had. I think the one other thing that when you talk when you talk to uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, when you look at the prototypical backs that they have, they look for a Rod Woodson. Well, this young man looks like a smaller version or a younger version, I should say, of the Rod Woodson. Rod hopefully will still be there, but look at who they've lost. Chad Brown, the linebacker they lose to Seattle, as well as Willie Williams. Dion Figures, Ernie Mills, Ray Seals, and Brenton Buckner. Um, Three of those guys are corners. There was absolutely no question in my mind that this was the area, and I think everybody looked at that. As much of a telegraph Kansas City wanted Gonzalez, there was no question that Pittsburgh wanted a defensive back. They consider themselves very, very fortunate to have a shot at Chad Scott. It was the man they wanted. It was the guy off the board they thought they could get, and it turned out and fell right in his lap. Well, now five defensive backs, five defensive linemen. That's uh, the most thus far as we've had 24 picks. Uh, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Carolina. The heavy metal of the playoffs last year coming right up. The Philadelphia Eagles in that trade, they moved down with Dallas. They own the selection.
all started with this dime tip. Suddenly, I was the boss. So I gave myself a day off and went shopping. <laughs> it was so great. Everything I tried on fit like it was cut just for me. Later at the salon, Candace Bergen shows up with my phone bill. This will make your day. Every call was just a dime a minute when I'm home, evenings and weekends. On the way out, I pass the dime on. Who wouldn't want a great rate like that? Call now for 200 minutes free. Hey, Brett. These guys have a beer menu. This beer is made with lingonberries. Ooh, and this one has a dash of espresso. Aura of forbidden coconut. Two cores. Since 1873. Original cores. Pure and simple. Peach medley. You see this? This beer has beer in it. Ramada is a nice place. Holiday Inn is a nice place. But when you stay four nights at Ramada, you can order one of over 100 Republic Picture videos absolutely free. Here, you'll get four nights older. So you can go home with a great personality or no personality. And maybe that's why last year, 23 million people chose Ramada over Holiday Inn. All things being equal, we're better. So call 1-800-2-RAMADA. If you want the theater experience, Without that theater experience, get a home theater system at Circuit City and enjoy it in the privacy of your own home. Circuit City, you can't get a lower price. We guarantee it. We are back with the Philadelphia Eagles on the clock here at the draft end as we race through the seven rounds today and tomorrow, racing across America featuring the Lone Star Derby from Thoroughbred Racing's newest facility, Lone Star Park in Grand Prairie, Texas. That's on uh, tomorrow at 6 Eastern time and bonus coverage of the Lexington Stakes from Keeneland as we are down the backstretch towards the Kentucky Derby. Down the stretch we come. That's tomorrow at 6 Eastern time. Well, Chad Scott now defensive back. The fifth cornerback taken in the first round. That's the most that we've ever had in the first round in the 31 years of the common draft starting in 1967. Mark Malone, Chad's got big, physical defensive back, really fits Pittsburgh, doesn't he? Well, he certainly does, Boomer. I mean, here's a guy that doesn't have that great closing speed, but in that 3-4 zone blitz type style of defense, he can play off and close and separate people from the ball, and that's what they were looking for. The Steelers thought there were about a half dozen first-round corners. They get the fifth one in the first round, so they're, they're looking real well. In terms of Rod Woodson, let me bring you up to date on that, Boomer. He has been talking to the Steelers, wants a lot more money than the Steelers are willing to offer. They have an offer on the table to him. They worked out on Thursday. The former Chicago Bear, Donnell Wolford, have an offer on the table to him, as well as an offer to the former Lion cornerback, Ryan McNeil. Now, according to the people I've talked to in Pittsburgh, they're talking to all three of those guys and their agents. The first guy to accept, the other two guys are going to be looking for work. Woodson turned down a deal that was reportedly worth about $20 million over five years last August, so he might be playing a very dangerous game. Chris, back to you in New York. Well, it's certain uh, that Rod Woodson, uh, Mark, is not quite the player that he once was. But on guile, on, on experience, I mean, he, he still, I mean, he may not be one of the all-time 75, you know, 75 anniversary team quarterbacks, which, by the way, he was. But don't you think that he is still a, a top corner? Or no, has he lost that much with the knee injury and he was so bold to come back in the Super Bowl that maybe in retrospect that might have hurt him? Who knows? I don't think so, Chris. I, th I think he's a very important part of what they do. And again, he fits into what the Pittsburgh Steelers try and do defensively. He gives you that big guy off the corner. He's a good run supporter. He can run with any receiver. We look at the physical size of the receivers that play in the AFC Central. He can match up with them from a physical standpoint. I think his game is more physical and the speed part of it has always been there. Now he's got to work on the techniques and the other aspect of it. He still fits in very well to what the Pittsburgh Steelers want to do. I think if Rod does stay there, you don't have to go through and teach somebody a new type of a system. You bring in a big Big rookie that can help out and make plays for you obviously you're decimated you've lost three corners I don't think you can lose a fourth and wind up with a lack of experience in the secondary which it looks like Pittsburgh may wind up with if they don't sign Rod well they have lost they have been hurt by free agency more than any other team oh. I'm sure if 
if the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, don't sign Rod Woodson, and you hate to see that happen. He should play his whole career with the Steelers. Uh, the, uh, the romanticists that we are in sports, we like to see that happen. Uh, several other teams would swoop in, like a San Francisco, like several. You'd have to take a look, although not at the price that Rod wants. See, that's the problem. I think what, what you're seeing from a lot of the free agents out here, guys that are out there now trying to sell their wares, is they want almost too much money. I think sometimes Rod Woodson has to look at, at down the road. Hey, Rod, the way I'd do it, I'd put in a lot of incentives. I mean, that's the only way you're going to make up the dollars because right now you don't want to be a free agent left out there as other people start to sign because there are other free agents that are available. Rod Rod Woodson belongs to the Steelers. He should be a Steeler because he also fits the Steelers' scheme very well. That's the other thing. How are you going to play someplace else? How does somebody else fit a Rod Woodson in when you're not sure how well he can run anymore, when you're not sure about a health factor? Those are all things that I think can work in Pittsburgh, but they got to be question marks in a lot of other places. That's true. That's true. Well, the Philadelphia Eagles are on the clock now. They've got about seven minutes to go. Speaking of cornerbacks, way on top, the first corner and and tied for the highest that a cornerback was ever selected in this 31 years of the common draft. In the third overall pick, Sean Springs, Ohio State, was drafted by the Seattle Seahawks. Our Kirk Herbstreet spoke of them a short while ago. Thanks, and, and one of the things, Sean, looking at this team, how do you think you fit in with the Seattle Seahawks? I think I fit in pretty well, you know. I think this team has uh, made some moves uh, make some things happen to win. Uh, they draft acquired Chad Brown and uh, another corner Willie Williams and uh, now Walter Jones and I. So uh, I think we're going to be all right and I'll fit in all right. What about your dad, your influence, his influence that he's had on you and, and just getting to this level throughout your entire life of chasing this dream? Well, it helps having a father playing in professional football league because uh, he can tell you the ins and outs of uh, pro, pro football. Even though I have to go through my own experience, uh, he just tell me some small things that'll help. The big thing, everybody knows you have the size, the speed, the quickness, even the savvy to play man-to-man. -man. The question that some people have, will you come up and make the big hit? Oh, most definitely. You wouldn't be able to play at Ohio State if you couldn't make the big hit. And I got in close, what is it with Ohio State? In the last four or five years, you guys have done a great job in just producing tremendous athletes in the first round. Well, I think the coaches at Ohio State do a great job recruiting athletes, and uh, we have a great strength coach. Coach Dave Kennedy does an excellent job with uh, all athletes that come through there. Good luck to you. I know you got a flight coming up. Okay, a long one. <laughs> Back to you, Chris. Hi, Kirk. Thank you. Wait, you want to interview a Buckeye? You get a Buckeye. Kirk Curb Street. Uh, a little more on Springs in just a minute, but the pick is in from the Eagles. Let's go to the podium. With the uh, 25th pick in the first round, the Philadelphia Eagles select John Harris, defensive end from the University of Virginia. Well, there's a name that maybe uh, the San Francisco 49ers and I on the not clock. In the first round. First, let me clean up one thing about Springs. Now he did not, he did not um, uh, obviously defend against him in practice this last year. But Joey Galloway, Terry Glenn, Chris Sanders, you go against those guys every yeah. day in practice. That's going to make you a good player. That's Springs with Seattle. John Harris. Hello. Good program, Virginia. <laughs> Linebackers we knew about. Sharper still sitting there. Well, he was a player on the rise. I was told uh, yesterday that John Harris may be a second-round possibility for the New Orleans Saints, so he had moved up. But in the first round, I think, Marcel, if you're going to go for a defensive end type, Wiley from Columbia gives you a great upside. Harris has good athletic ability, but he wasn't the consistent player yet. He's a guy that needs to develop. He's still a guy who's a workout warrior type, good computer numbers, but he wasn't the kind of player at Virginia that he should have been considering the physical ability he possesses, Joe. And I think what happens now, though, Mel, is you get with Ray Rhodes in that program, you either get on board with Ray Rhodes or he beats you on board. I mean, this is a guy who's going to drive you. Emmett Thomas will put in the defense that's necessary for them to go out and make plays. They needed the help up front. I think that Ray Rhodes is the kind of guy who can take someone who may not have been as motivated in college and get him pointed in the right direction and get the production out of him that he feels like he needs to make his ball club better. Six, seven and a half. Usually you figure you talk about uh, the basketball at Virginia with guys that says let's let's go quickly to Sal Palantonio who's at the Jets headquarters. But uh, Philadelphia this surprise you. I think it surprised a lot of people in Philadelphia because his name has not come up anywhere. The Eagles was one of the best kept secrets in the city of brotherly love, definitely. I talked to Ray Rhodes just a few seconds before he handed in the pick. He said they really liked John Harris. They liked his size. They had problems stopping the run on both the end spots. And now, of course, with William Fuller gone, they need somebody who's real big, who can rush the passer and stop the run. They said defensive uh, line coach Mike Turgovic really liked this guy. So that's their pick. It'll be a surprise to a lot of people, Boomer. 
All right, just certainly, uh, uh, Sal. And let's go up to Tom Jackson. And I, I know you studied all the defensive players uh, on the film, Tom. Is this a name you expected to hear in the first round? Now, wait a minute, you're sitting now. <laughs> uh, what happened? Is it that long a day? Well, I think I think that certainly one of the things that you look at is some guys reaching at, at a certain position. And I think certainly when you look at John Harris, he's a quality ball player. But if you were looking for a defensive end, I don't think there's another guy that matches up right now to Trevor Price on the board. Trevor Bri Price is another high octane guy. He's from Clemson, uh, weighs in the 280 range, uh, has great quicks at the line of scrimmage. I guess the one negative to his play is that he tends to play a little bit high, uh, go uh, stand straight up as soon as the ball is snapped but it has great athleticism you could teach the techniques to him uh, uh, I just think that this is a, a big reach in getting John Harris right now in this draft well it sat you down so obviously it must be a, a big reach well him off the feet. San Francisco 49ers are next on the clock and we may see a quarterback go in the first round and if it is guy that played not far from where John Harris Virginia Tech Jim Druckenmiller that's my guess we'll be back <laughs> Tampa. Now let's go down to check in for the latest from her. Andrea. Well, Chris, I just talked to the Niners just a short time ago, and they said that they plan to go with the player who is uh, they've been focused on all along, quarterback Jim Druckenmiller from Virginia Tech. Now, when I spoke to Steve Mariucci a couple of days ago, he admitted that he had some mixed emotions about his own quarterback, Pat Barnes. But he said that Druckenmiller was clearly the highest-rated quarterback that they had and that that would be the guy that they would go with if he was available. The Niners just confirmed that a short time ago. They also told me, though, that they would have tried to move up to Miami's pick at 15 to take Tony Gonzalez, but that Gonzalez had already gone to uh, Kansas City at 13. Now, there's been a couple of questions about Druckenmiller, the fact that he's worked primarily out of the shotgun, and his age, he will be a 25-year-old rookie. I asked Steve Mariucci about this, these things. He said, as for working in the shotgun, he'll be okay under center, and even talked about how big his hands are and the fact that uh, he didn't think it would be a, a tough, d tough decision for him. Uh, okay, Chris, let's head back to you in New York right now. All right, Andrew. Well, certainly uh, they confirmed it a while ago that it would be Druckenmiller, and they're just happy they didn't have to make a move up. They stand put, and they get the player that they like. And at the Senior Bowl, I guess after about the third day uh, working behind center, not the shotgun, everybody there was happy with the way that he worked. Now, Druckenmiller, Jake Plummer, who was one of our favorite players in the draft, Arizona State, Pat Barnes and Mariucci coach of California. Probably the only three quarterbacks we will hear from here on day one in the first three rounds. Break them down. How would you go? Well, I think, first of all, you take a look at Jim Drunkenmiller. I mean, the completions at 54% is a little bit lower than you like, but the, the touchdowns to interception ratio, I think, is very good. 34 to 18. He did play in five different systems there. You like his versatility, and if the kid played in five different systems, he obviously is in a situation where he can adjust, so that's very good. Jake Plummer is just a natural playmaker. A lot of people have compared him to Joe Montana coming out of school. I particularly agree with that. Has great natural athletic ability, and Pat Barnes has a screw in his wrist still. They don't think it's going to be a problem but was very productive under Steve Mariucci in California I did have a chance to talk to Steve Mariucci he liked all three of them he likes Pat Barnes he feels for sure that this kid can play at this level I think the only thing about Jake Plummer is is that he looks a little bit skittish in the pocket focuses on one receiver and bails out the guy that everybody liked was Drunken Miller. But you know what you get in these three guys is you get whatever you want across the table. You got the big, strong guy in the middle. Everybody thought, gosh, how could Drunken Miller wind up in San Francisco? Well, Elvis Gerbeck was out of Michigan. He fits the same kind of a mold, big guy in the pocket. You got Jake running around all over the place, not too bad a fit either. And Pat Barnes, the guy in the middle who is mobile but yet can stay in the pocket. All of them, I think, have the ability to play in this league. And I'm not surprised that a quarterback will go here. I'm just disappointed it's probably going to cost me dinner. Well, well, but we could have told you that, Joe. <laughs> well, very Great. quickly on our sprint Freedom. video conference right now, let's uh, welcome in the uh, head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles, Ray Rhodes. And we're talking San Francisco. He, of course, has many a Super Bowl ring uh, on the staff of the San Francisco 49ers. Good afternoon, Ray. How you doing, Chris? Well, not bad. You, you kind of you, you went down. So you got an extra pick for for staying having a uh, a pat hand if you will but I think you surprised a lot of people coach uh, with a John well, Harris sure a moment ago. I'm sure we did. John's a young man we've been studying quite a bit. We've looked at all the uh, defensive linemen around the league and also the tight ends and everything else but again this was a, a draft pick that we really like and we feel real good about it. 
Well, size, I mean, it's interesting. You see, I mean, 6'7", six, 6'8", six, uh, that's a different sort of player. Size, obviously, on defense, I mean, he's not huge and bulky, but size is something where you look to upgrade. Am I not correct? Uh, that's correct. We had him in a couple weeks ago. He's a 6'7 half, 287 pounds, and we expect this young man to continue to grow a little bit. We feel extremely good about this guy. We had a chance to look at a lot of tape, and uh, as far as the scouts and coaches are concerned, we feel real good about our pick. Uh, Ray, this is Tom Jackson. Uh, when you were studying tape and you looked at the guys, I'm going to make you, uh, ask you to make a comparison. Uh, John Harris to Trevor Price. What, what did you see as a difference between those two guys? Well, again, you know, I, I don't know if Trevor Price has been drafted or not, and I don't think it's fair to talk about Trevor Price and comparing John Harris with him. But here's a guy that we feel extremely good about. And, uh, Tom, again, at some point, you and I can discuss this, but at this time here, the young man's still on the board being ready to be drafted, and uh, John Harris is our draft pick. All right, Ray, you, you, you've, you've definitely been a man of conviction, and now you're going straight forward with him. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Coach of the Philadelphia Eagles, Ray Rhodes, and now... Of the 49ers, here's Gene Washington, former Niner. He'll like this one. With the 26th selection in the first round, the San Francisco 49ers have selected quarterback Jim Druckenmiller from Virginia Tech. Carolina's well, no, on the clock. A different type of quarterback. I mean, look, the long face, the height, he's more of a Jim Kelly type than a movable Joe Montana and an obviously movable Steve Young. Well, Chris, he bench presses close to 400 pounds, so he's in there with the offensive and defensive line and working out. That's allowed him to gain tremendous leadership ability. Everybody rallies around him. He's got that big hand. He can really throw the football. Powerful arm. I think, as we mentioned, at the senior bowl, he showed he can take a snap from center, drop back five to seven steps, and throw the football. He's a confident kid. He's a guy who I thought got better late in his career over the last two seasons. Did not have a great supporting cast show. You said 54% completion percentage. Yeah. That would have been 64 if his receivers would have caught the football. So I think you're looking at a guy who did not have the supporting cast of a plumber or a Barnes, but has tremendous physical ability at 6'5", 230, and this kid has a gun. He really does. And, and, you know, I think he's much more mobile than a lot of people give him credit for. You saw his ability to run down the football. I think Jim Kelly would have loved to have been able to run as well as Jim Drunken Miller. He's a big guy. He stays in the pocket. All you have to do is take a look at what Elvis Gerbeck was able to do in the San Francisco offense. Mm -hmm. I think this young man has that same type of capabilities. Any one of these three quarterbacks would have worked well for him. I think this kid here gives you the physical size that you want and probably could come on a lot quicker. Don't expect a quarterback to step in really in a hurry in San Francisco. Steve Young is there. I think he has a lot of confidence in playing at least two, maybe three more years. It's a perfect time frame, and we just see the San Francisco 49ers continue to just feed that position with quality people. Well, plus, if you're keeping score at home, Drunken Miller, 13 letters. That ties the record for the longest name in the first round ever by Joe DeLamalleur, former blocker of the Bills. Carolina on our mind next. It's third and long. Clearly, they're thinking pass. I'm telling you, Troy Aikman's third down completion percentage is out of sight. They line up in a passing formation, and Aikman is back to pass. He's looking, looking. He's got a receiver wide open. He's still looking. Whoa, what's going on? And, ooh, Aikman's down. Oh, he had all the time in the world. You've got to ask yourself, what was this guy thinking? Brute, it's all part of the game. All right, guys, same play. The Michelin X1, with a six-year unlimited mileage tread life warranty, gives you better wet traction than any rain tire, plus Michelin control in most driving conditions. After all, it hasn't rained that much in years. Emptiness. How can I fill this emptiness? It's not tricky. Eat something. Like the $4 Turkey Melt BLT combo. Four bucks for a fresh, hot, hand-carved Turkey Melt BLT side and drink. Only at Boston Market. Introducing the ultimate stuff by Hager. If you only had one thing to wear, this would be it. Where the hell are my heads? Tommy Spinelli is a hitman who... That, would, of course, would have changed Ron 
had Peyton Manning decided to come out, his decision to stay at Tennessee dictating the strategy in so many draft picks in round one. What do you think, though, of the Niners' pick of Drucker Miller? Well, I think Drucker Miller is certainly a, a, a fine product, and I think it's going to take him some time to really assimilate his skills to the West Coast style of offense. My personal preference as the number one quarterback this year in the draft was Jake Plummer. I think Plummer's the kind of guy that in the NFL nowadays, you've got to be able to avoid the rush, where I think Drucker Miller's more your prototype quarterback, stand in the pocket, look downfield, and make your read and throw the football. I thought Plummer's the kind of guy that could make something happen. I think Drucker Miller eventually will become a very good quarterback, but it's going to take him some time in the West Coast offense. He hopes to surpass the accomplishments of Don Strock and Will Fuhrer, two other former Hokies, of course, who were drafted and played quarterback in the NFL. Now to our whip around, starting with Mark Malone in St. Louis. Mark? Orlando Pace, St. Louis first pick and the first overall pick of this NFL draft. He should be heading to LaGuardia Airport and be here in St. Louis later this evening. Since then, well, the Rams have looked at lunch menus and also the draft board and quarterbacks. That's where they look to go in the second round. Now let's go to Hank Goldberg in Seattle. A series of trade-up maneuvers produced Sean Springs and Walter Jones. Cornerback and left tackle, two guys who will come in, be impact players right away. The Seahawks think that. In fact, rival coaches think that. I said to one, or one said to me, what's going on there? I said, they're done for the day. He said, thank God. Meanwhile, in the Seattle War Room, Dennis Erickson and uh, young David Baring are looking at the interview that was done recently a couple minutes ago with Sean Springs with a lot of intensity. Let's go to Hempstead, Sal Palantonio with the Jets. Bill Parcells dropped all the way to the number eight pick and took linebacker James Farrier out of Virginia. But don't expect him to move from the top pick in the second round and do expect him to go defense again. Now let's go to Andrea Kramer in Tampa. The Buccaneers bolster their offense big time with the 12th and 16th picks, taking running back Warwick Dunn and wide receiver Riddell Anthony. Tony Dungy told me the team was sweating bullets on the pick before Anthony when Miami took Yateel Green, but they got their man in the second round. Look for them to go for some blocking help. Now let's go to Linda Cohn in New Orleans. Mike Ditka thrilled with his first round pick, offensive tackle Chris Naoli. Now he's got two early second round picks at 33 and 39. The Saints tell me they'll go offense with one pick, defense with the other, not necessarily in that order. Plenty of players out there Mike Ditka still embraces, including Jason Ferguson, the defensive tackle, and Corey Dillon, the running back. Now let's go to Miami and Chris Mortensen. Well, the Dolphins stayed right here in South Florida by taking University of Miami receiver Yatil Green. So Jimmy Johnson has had one draft pick, two bowls of chili, he has nine picks left in this day, and I think the nachos are coming later. Let's go to Chris Myers with the Dallas Cowboys. I'd say that nothing hurt the Cowboys more last year than the lack of production at tight end because of injury. So they drafted 6'7", 280-pound David LaFleur out of LSU. They hope that he'll help that offense be more productive than ranking 24th. Troy Aikman worked him out and went to the Cowboys and said, this is a guy I want on our football team. And when they drafted him in the war room, they were happy to get David LaFleur. Let's now go to Green Bay and Gary Danielson. Well, the Packers are still waiting, but maybe it's a good time to show the difference between the Green Bay Packers and a lot of the other teams in the National Football League. When you look into the war room, a lot of people involved. Of course, the community owns this team. And look where the president and CEO sits, Bob Harlan next to the water cooler. Things a little different here in Green Bay. Maybe if uh, Jones sat next to the water cooler, Jimmy Johnson might still be in Miami, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Gary, thank you very much. Well, the pack will be up soon enough. The Carolina Panthers are on the clock now, and if there's one thing that the general manager of the Panthers, Bill Polian, has had experience at doing, it's picking down right near the bottom of the draft. Of course, when he picked it with the Buffalo Bills, having gone to the Super Bowl, remember there are only 28 teams, not 27 once upon a time. So late last few picks in the 91 draft, they got Henry Jones, who became a Pro Bowl strong safety. They got Thomas Smith, uh, a very good and underrated cornerback, in a pick very down low. Uh, they get uh, John Fina. Well, that was really after Bill was moved along. But they, there's a whole philosophy, and Mel and Joe, you could talk about it too, in picking very low. You can never really identify your one or two players. You can have your eye on one, two, three, four that you hope fall through and have an order there knowing there's only one of them. Or you have a couple guys, as they did with Tyrone Poole a couple years ago, that are like 40 that you know are going to be there and either trade down or still take somebody. Now, I know that Bill and company are shocked 
that Ray Carruth is still there. They figured he was long gone. That was not one of the names that they were hoping to fall. He has fallen, and that's the debate right now because they have their players at 38 and 40 ready to go, Mel. Well, you see Corey Dillon. He could still be there possibly at 33 for the New Orleans Saints. Certainly didn't expect that. You see, like I say, Jerry Wunsch, the big 328-pound offensive tackle. And Jason Taylor, how does he fit in? More to a 3-4 with not many teams using that defense. That's why he's dropped down just a bit. I think Ross Verba is going to be a steal. He can play guard or tackle. Guy that's very, very solid, very tough, very experienced. And Dan Neal at Texas. I mean, there's some good football players. I, I, mean, think... I mean, we talk, I think we focus a little yeah. on the first round, but every pick in the first round is not a good one. 50% are bad. Right. And the second third fourth round is where you get some major bargains and we see some right there well and I think I think boomer brings up a really great point bill is drafted in this position so many times I mean you're looking for it the people like San Francisco like Dallas like Buffalo that have been in this position before have a real good idea where they're looking you also have to consider Sam Mills's age and Kevin Green's age I mean Jason Taylor right here as a 3-4 linebacker would not be a bad pick he's six foot six he gives you a lot of size plus your linebacking core is getting a little bit a little bit on in years it's amazing that after two years of existence, you can look for backup at some of your aging players. Maxi, Toy Cook, these are aging players in the secondary. Carolina on the clock, four and a half to go. We'll be back. Sky Rat, this is Dirty Bird. I've spotted a gold mine with a freshly washed beauty. Rock and Dirty Bird. Let's rock and roll. All right, Sky Rat, make it messy. Ah! We're still clean, DB. And almost home free. Okay, Sky Rat, I'll get him. Only Vigoro Lawn Fertilizer gives you more predictable, continuous feeding, whether it's hot, cold, wet, or dry. Vigoro. People everywhere are singing its praises. Only at the Home Depot. Just what does it... Looking for a Chevrolet? Buy direct. Call 1-800-SHOP-CHEVY. Buy direct. Call now. It's back. It's the basketball tournament. April 25th. For application or information, call 1-800-ALL-LAKE or stop by your local Burger King restaurant or the Convention and Visitors Bureau office. Ecologically speaking, the NHL playoffs can be a therapeutic period in a player's life, an opportunity to work through one's issues, to find a quiet place to sit and reflect, to reach out to those around one, to ponder what is good, and ultimately, to reach one's lifelong goal. The Stanley Cup Playoffs on ESPN2. Something to contemplate. And we are back at the pick number 27, the Carolina Panthers. There's about two minutes left on the clock. They want to see if anybody wants to move up before they move forward with their selection. There's two minutes to call or forever hold your peace. Let's call in on Chris Mortensen down in Miami. Mort, where, where do you think they're headed? Well, you know, I thought they were ahead of defense because they need to get younger on defense because they got the older, as Joe was talking about earlier, some older players on defense. You know, I think they're looking at Colorado. Greg Jones, the outside linebacker, a possibility. But then you think about another Colorado player who slipped, Ray Carruth, a wide receiver. That's a long way for him to go. And even though they have Moose and Muhammad, it may be too much value there. Uh, but it should be an interesting pick because I know that Dom Capers' plan is to stay young on defense as, as the older guys are phased out in the next couple of years. Chris? Paul Moore, that's for sure. They got a lot of ways they can go. And uh, remember, they really didn't have Tim Biakabatuka for much of last year because of the injury. That's so almost like getting another number one pick already signed and ready to go next year. And his knee has progressed uh, beautifully, we are told. Tom Jackson, this is a team that uh, we've seen uh, from step one build itself. Um, they got a couple places they can go, but it's amazing that they're looking at depth already. I mean, they've only been around two years. What do you think they should do? Well, I, I think in talking to Bill Poley, and uh, Chris Mortensen is certainly uh, moving in the right direction. They, they talked about wide receiver, and they talked about replenishing some in their defensive front. And I think a, a name to keep in mind as we look toward this choice is a linebacker out of Akron named Jason Taylor. He's perfectly suited to the 3-4 system. And we've got about four teams playing that system in this league where you want to 
put him out in space, not make him be forced to, to sit over a tight end, but allow him to be out in space, work with his speed and quickness. He's got a tall, lanky body. Uh, he could be the, the, the type of pass rusher that they have right now in, in Lathan and Kevin Green. Uh, certainly, Green starting to age a little bit, but I think that he's a perfect fit for that defense. Well, if it is indeed a pick, I think it's Ray Carruth who has fallen. They're amazed that he's there. Or someone that they would replenish their defensive backfield, uh, like perhaps uh, a Mike Logan, somebody like that, a, a true strong safety who one day could move in for a guy like Brett Maxey. We'll find out in a moment. Pick is up. And they've got to go for value if it's the highest rated With the, guy. the uh, 27th pick in the first round, the Carolina Panthers select Ray Carruth, oh, there it is. wide receiver from the University of Colorado. But Denver is now on the clock. Well, we, we were not sure. That there's no way, Mel, that they thought that he would be there and Bill Polian looked long and hard and Tom Capers. That's value for them right there. And a great value in the 27 hole. Well, another player. We talked about Anthony and Hilliard's ability after the catch. That's why he's wearing number 21, a former running back. Great speed. He'll say he ran a 4-4-3 during his individual workout. During that same workout, 75 passes thrown his direction, dropped one ball. So he body catches a little bit, but he's experienced. He can get deep. Everything about Ray Caruso has big playability. Get the ball in the end zone move the ball down the field. You see him here against a good Washington Husky defense again making a big play. See the speed I can run away from people easily catches the football and he's gone. So I mean you're getting a burner who's one of the fastest players in this draft even on a bad day. You know come across he's tough. Like I said look at the ability in the, in the broken field. Now, there's not that much separating these receivers. So you know Hilliard goes seventh and Cruz goes late first round. In terms of value there's no difference. I think they do have Rocket Ishmael, of course, and they were going to use him a little bit more, but uh, speed, they did not have a classic speed receiver. Muhammad Big, pretty fast. We've seen Muhammad, but this is something they did not expect. We'll, we'll discuss that in a moment, but let's now bring in uh, another coach of a uh, soon-to-be third-year team on our video conference call, uh, Coach Tom Coughlin of the Jacksonville Jaguars. And, uh, boy, I mean, it's so fast. You're just sitting around here for most of the first round. Now, who would have thought at, after two years that, uh, that you'd have to wait most of the first round to swing in action. So congratulations, obviously, Tom, on a job well done. Thanks, Chris. You, Much uh, different draft for us, obviously. Yes, I mean, you uh, and you got some more beef on the defensive line. You right. made, uh, with Ronaldo, when you made Joe very happy by picking a Notre Dame player. <laughs> well, we thought we needed to uh, bring in a young defensive lineman. I like to bring a defensive lineman and an offensive lineman in on a yearly basis and uh, we needed to uh, fortify our front a little bit with a young aggressive player a guy who's got a great motor who chased the passer down has the ability to close on the quarterback so uh, uh, we feel real good about Ronaldo win I know you tried among others uh, to get Gilbert Brown you were close to it this softened that blow a little bit I mean that's in the way in the past but that was your master plan you got some size inside now anyway well, we did, and we have a player that can play defensive tackle or even slide out at end, and he's not only a first and second down player, but we may be able to use him on third down as well. Tom, if you can separate yourself for a moment from being the football coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars and a man that built the team to just a fan a little bit or watching from afar, your quarterback, Mark Brunel, and the strides that he made and the growth that he and the team made in December, in January, I mean, are you excited? Yes, you're his coach, but... Are you excited to see what he can do in the next year or two? Very much so. Looking forward to seeing Mark's continued growth and development. And then the things that happened this year were exciting and showed the ability that Mark has as a, as a leader, as a quarterback, as a passer, and also as a great ability to run. So we're excited about building, continuing to build this team around Mark Brunel. How about Natron Meads for a whole season? Natron really showed his stuff down the stretch with some great plays. Uh, in the playoffs and uh, has got himself on track. It took a while last year, but now we feel good about Natron and he and James Stewart give us a nice one-two punch. Well, they're talking football, not the TPC down in Jacksonville. Congratulations, <laughs> and we'll see you a little bit later. Thanks, Chris. All right, Tom, thank you. Tom Coughlin, coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Denver, New England, and Green Bay, and that's all she wrote for round number one. The Broncos on the clock. Tom might have an observation. You're born, you go to school, and then one day, things begin to get interesting. Now, instead of preparing, you're doing. The stakes are a lot higher than they were in high school. Because out here, the tests you're given are of your honor. 
your courage, and your commitment. This is your journey. It's time you got underway. Call 1-800-USA-NAVY. Let the journey begin. He's a five-time champion. He's $800. What do you think? <laughs> Just can't make the decision on my own. Here, boy. So you can think about it. Thanks. I really think he's beautiful, honey. What do you think? You were sent to me. Okay, remember him. You gotta like one of them. Polaroid. See what develops. I'm just glad you were happy. This is breakfast. This is something McDonald's made famous. This is our latest invention. Say good morning to the My Size Meal. Good morning, My Size Meal. Now when you buy any drink, coffee, soft drink, orange juice. Any size. And hash brown. You can get one of four hot breakfast sandwiches, like this sausage biscuit with egg, for just 55 cents. 55 cents. Every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. 55 cents every day? I promise. That's chicken pee. This is fast. I'm Carol Martin, and this is My McDonald's. STP Son of a Gun Protectant makes vinyl truly shine. Leather more lustrous. And rubber more brilliant and beautiful. It works so well, in fact, some people even use it on cars. Son of a Gun Protectant and Son of a Gun Tire Glaze by STP. Hey, Dan. What's wrong? Hey, Grant. Uh, bad show. Hair looked bad, teleprompter went down, made some mistakes on some highlights. I got something to say, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Grant. I appreciate that. No problem, man. We're back, and as we look at the uh, great display, the Hall of Fame display, almost, uh, that's it's a young man by the name of John Elway. Another guy that wore number seven, and he didn't get in a debate with us. He throws to a young man named Shannon Sharp these days, tight end Denver Broncos, truly in the crib with our Sterling Sharp. And uh, Sterling, let's go now to Carolina, which is home for you. Ray Carruth, did you expect him to go this far down in the draft? Is this a great pick for Carolina, or are there some flaws in his game that you kind of spotted looking at film? I think if there's a thing, Chris, that's called a safe pick, I think Ray Carruth is it because of the fact that they got Muhammad who can use that big body, and they got Chris, uh, Mark Carey that can work the middle of the field. Ray Carruth is going to get an opportunity to do exactly what he did in college, this right here. Great patience in the go route, use his great speed, run the ball down. He, drop, he doesn't drop any footballs like this because he uses the speed. He understands that nobody's going to have an opportunity to hit him in the face. He uses great quickness, great patience, and all of that, and then using your speed. But I think the most important thing is he doesn't have to worry about taking a big hit over the middle because he'll get an opportunity. The one thing I think Caruto may have to work on is if they have any injuries in Carolina and he has to do work as a wide receiver, use his speed, control his body weight. But I think running back to the ball, running back to the football, using his hands, I think that's the one thing Ray Caruto is going to have to use. And, Chris, if he can get his hands together, I think it's going to be a nice time in Carolina back down at the crib. All right, Sterling, the, commit, the pick is in already with Denver, and uh, let's see if they go a young man from Louisville. With the uh, 28th pick in the draft, the Denver Broncos select Trevor Price, oh. defensive tackle from Clemson. We are talking about New England Sam is Madison now on the clock. from Louisville to make Tommy happy. Uh, but Trevor Price again for Denver, is that a, uh, is that a good value pick? Well, I think in terms of the first round, Chris, I think it is. I think what Trevor Price needs to do is utilize leverage better. And if you say, why did he start to drop? You know, he added some weight. He lost a little speed and quickness, and he played very high at Clemson. Of course, former outside linebacker early in his career at Michigan. You see even here when he makes a play, how high he plays, and then coming out of his stance, getting after the quarterback. And I think he's got to be coached properly to improve his technique. But he does hustle. He is a guy who really likes to play the game of football and give you great effort to work hard to improve in the areas he's the Efficient. So at least from that standpoint, he's not going to come in thinking he has all the answers. So I like that, but he definitely is a work in progress, Chris. More of a developmental type. So uh, if there's a reason that he did slide, it's because of the fact that he definitely needs pro coaching. Well, the Broncos have picked the defensive player in the first round, which uh, kind of gets the ears up of our Tom Jackson. And Tommy, 
they're still kind of uh, shocked over the 13 and 3 season and, and just in the playoffs one and out against Jacksonville they looked high far and wide at the film to find out what happened was this one of the areas that broke down at the end well I think that it was easy for the Broncos to address the areas that kept them from winning two more football games uh, they went out and got Neil Smith uh, they got Tony Jones from Baltimore on their offensive line I think the expectation as they went into the draft was that they might look to get another cover corner but now you look at that defensive line right there and then you add Trevor Price to that line as he is that development in motion uh, I think they certainly will be able to put a lot of pressure on people up front and if you don't don't have another cover guy and they still may get that later on down the road at least you're going to get a lot of pressure from the guys up front that always makes it a little bit easier to cover Chris well Neil Smith just a one year contract uh, but yet a, 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 an exciting one year contract if you look at it from the Denver Broncos point of view playing in the same division against the Kansas City Chiefs who a year before were 13 and 3 well now Tommy we're down to the Super Bowl teams Patriots and Packers we'll be back. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Can I see the guitar? You play? I've been known to. That's cool. What's your name? It's on your guitar. Since 1873, original chords, pure and simple. Call it strength. A world leader in insurance and investment. Call it expertise. $450 billion in assets under management. Call it vision. Anticipating the opportunities in more than 50 countries. Call it innovation. Give clients smarter choices in a changing world. Call it AXA. Here you know us as the equitable. AXA, go ahead. You can rely on us. And so, after 35 years, I return to Russell, Kansas, to my friends and my family, to that very special place where they always called me by my first name. Great lunch. Barb, take a check. Of course, Bob. Can I see some ID? Driver's license? Consider the Visa check card. It automatically deducts from your checking account everywhere Visa's accepted. No ID needed. It works like a check, only better. I, I just can't win. Only by going alone in silence can one get into the heart of the wilderness. All other travel is mere dust and hotels and baggage and chatter. back at the draft at the theater in New York City New York and Boston doesn't take very long to drive between the two three four hours perhaps but the rivalry in sports began a long long time ago it began in baseball when the Bay played pitched for the Red Sox in 1914 to 1919 January 3rd 1920 the curse of the Bambino began it was sold to the New York Yankees the rest is history 714 home runs later He's a hero. And the Yankees were winners. The Red Sox not got back, won a World Series since the babe was there. Little did Bob Kraft know that the Beantown Big Apple War would move on to another sport. When Bill Parcells coached the Patriots at the Super Bowl last year, and now he's coaching in the division with the New York Football Jets. It's Pete Carroll's turn to take over the coaching reins of a Super Bowl team. And Pete Carroll, oddly enough, once upon a time coach of the New York Jets who the last four years did about as well as anybody else better than anybody else had one year and was really was fired by Leon Hess. Now Pete Carroll is not going to bring that up with anything of a problem with the Jets but it works both ways here and oh by the way they play the third week of the season on a Sunday night Parcells returns to Foxborough. So we have an interesting Patriots and Jets have been rivals in the division. I think we up at about five notches now. I think Joe. so too. I also think, you know, Pete Carroll comes from now having gone to San Francisco, mm -hmm. really had a chance to work with a championship quality ball club. I think 
moving away and coming back just gives you a whole different perspective. I think Pete Carroll right now has got them New England positioned to try and take them to the next level. But what really I think is going to happen up in New England is going to be Drew Bledsoe proving that it wasn't all Bill Parcells. I see Drew Bledsoe really dedicating himself to this season and going out and saying, I just want to prove to the world that we are a good football team. It wasn't all Bill Parcells coaching that got us to the Super Bowl. There's a lot of good football players here. We're going to go out and prove it. We're going to help Coach Carroll prove it. I think there's a little bit of vindictiveness going to happen, too, up there, Chris. Well, maybe both ways in this deal, uh, Joe. Let's go quickly to Chris Mortensen in Miami, staying with our AFC East theme, and uh, get a clue what the Patriots are going to do under Pete. Well, you know, I talked to Bob Kraft and Pete Carroll both this week, and they seem, you know, fairly comfortable that they would get a defensive player in this particular area. You know, the defensive line, they, they lost Farrah Collins on a restricted free agent offer sheet to the Philadelphia Eagles. Cornerbacks, you know, hey, there's Chris Canty from Kansas State. There's Sam Madison from Louisville. They've got to strengthen that defense uh, still because Pete Carroll has a lot of different twists in mind for the Patriots defense. Chris? All right, Mort, thank you. Uh, if, if it is defense at this point, Mel, uh, the, let's look at their secondary, and I mean they get an excellent football player in Lawyer Malloy, that's for sure, and Ty Law. I mean they've got the, you know, the judicial system is working up at the Patriots with Ty Law and Lawyer Malloy. Now what do they do? Well, I think Steve Israel is the key, Christian. You know, they signed him as a free agent. He played pretty well in San Francisco, but more as a nickel back. And the question is, can he be a starter? They probably want to fortify that position a little bit more, especially in a cornerback deep, deep draft like we had this year. Well, who's left in the corner area, Mel? Well, I think you have some good ones still out there. I mean, when you look at the cornerback board and you see the players are still there, I mean, you're going to see quality. There's not that much difference between, say, a Dexter McLeon and a Chad Scott. And Dexter McLeon, a former quarterback at Clemson, really improved. He has good feet. Uh, he's a little inexperienced, but he got better. Chris Canty ran 340s after the, the season was over. The third 40 finally got into the 448 range. Ty Howard's probably the best athlete of all the corners. Sam Madison's an experienced guy with also a four, played some wide receivers, so you know he's He's an all-around type athlete. And Kevin Abrams did move up. I put him 10th. He's small, uh, but he's fast. He was one of the fastest players actually in this draft. I think that's where you wind up with both Candy and Abrams become the two quickest guys and probably could fit the need as, as New England tries to upgrade the speed. Remember, Pete Carroll likes to be aggressive yes. on the defensive side of the ball, so he needs people who can cover one-on-one. -on -one. Candy would be a good one there. Yeah, you know, Gamble he looks for speed a little bit more than Bill does, and that might be the pick. New England with six and a half minutes to go, followed by the champion Packers. And in other news. She'll get a cart. We'll insist. Goodwill, a good deal more than... Eyeglass Emporium is the eye care center to see for a second pair of glasses free. Get two pairs, including frames and lenses, for the price of one at Eyeglass Emporium. Get two pairs for you or one pair each for two people. Get a pair for work and a free pair for play. Get a pair for mom and a free pair for dad. Get a kid's pair and a spare pair free. Glasses, sport glasses, bifocals, over 100 frames to choose from for your second pair. High Glass Emporium, your eye care center to see in Lake Park Center near Ward in Michigan City. Night. Mario Lemieux and the Penguins trail the series 1-0 as they look to square things up with the Legion of Doom. Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, tonight at 7.30. The Stanley Cup playoffs on ESPN. Lindros looks tough. Let's get his prints. When we gave drivers of the Mercury Villager a smooth car-like ride, we didn't forget about the passenger's comfort. We gave them independent heating, air conditioning, and separate audio controls, along with four captain's chairs and an innovative sliding rear seat, all giving further proof that Mercury Villager's back seats don't take a back seat to anyone. The Wildcats are number one. Now you can get your piece of Arizona history with Sports Illustrated's Wildcat National Championship Package, free with your paid subscription. SI's limited edition, hardbound, individually numbered Wildcat commemorative and this officially licensed National Championship mini basketball are free when you order 54 issues of SI for only $1.48 an issue. Save over 55% off the cover price. Use your credit card. Celebrate Arizona's dream season with two exclusive collectibles from Sports Illustrated. Get into it. 
And welcome back to ESPN's draft coverage. The AFC champion New England Patriots are on the clock, the 29th pick of round number one. It was about a year ago at this time that the Eagles' Ray Rhodes had us all saying who. He took Jermaine Mayberry, an offensive lineman out of Texas A&M Kingsville. Mayberry dressed for two games and got undressed when he did get into the lineup. Well, in the first round, John Harris, also the surprise pick by the Eagles at number 25. With the uh, 25th pick in the first round, the Philadelphia Eagles select John Harris, defensive end from the University of Virginia. We had him in a couple weeks ago. He's the six, seven and a half, 287 pounds, and we expect this young man to continue to grow a little bit. We feel extremely good about this guy. We had a chance to look at a lot of tape, and uh, as far as the scouts and coaches are concerned, we feel real good about our pick. So Ray Rhodes drafting defense and then getting a little bit defensive because there will be people who will question this guy, John Harris, the tallest player in the ACC, played more games in a Virginia Cavalier uniform than anybody ever, but Mel Kuyper, our Draft guru rated him the 16th best defensive end in the draft. Mel, what do you think of this? Well, Chris, I think when you look at the top 150 board, I had him like 146. And last time we had a reach of this magnitude, it was Tommy Maddox, who Joe remembers very well, when he was selected by Dan Reeves and the Denver Broncos. So I think when you look at, at this particular pick, I thought he would be maybe a bargain in the fourth or fifth round. Obviously, in the first round, uh, I would take some exception with that selection. You're you're, say, you're saying he's not a bargain? <laughs> well, I think when you when you look at, at John Harris, I think you, you're you talking about a guy, uh, Chris, that has some ability, certainly. I wouldn't say it would have been a bargain in the fourth or fifth round if I didn't see some upside potential. Certainly has the great size, certainly very durable. He got stronger late in his career. So for Ray Rhodes to roll the dice this early certainly was a major surprise. But at least you get a guy who has some ability, was on the field at Virginia, and got better as this year progressed. I would hope you get a guy who has some ability if you drafted him in the first round, the fourth defensive end taken from the ACC. News breaking down in Tampa. Let's go to Andrea Kramer. Andrea? Well, Chris, I'm in Tampa, but the news is breaking actually in Pittsburgh. Uh, now, we just saw at the uh, 24th pick they took cornerback Chad Scott, where they're going to have another cornerback to add. Uh, they finally have come to an agreement, a four-year deal with Janelle Wolford. He's going to be leaving the Bears. They've been really working in the, on this all week. Now, Wolford was scheduled to visit with a couple of other teams next week, next week including the San Francisco 49ers, but he is going to sign a four-year deal with the Steelers, leaving the Chicago Bears. That's Janelle Wolford. Let's go back to Chris Fowler in Bristol. So they sign a veteran, and they draft Chad Scott, the corner out of Maryland. That's it for our draft update. Approaching hour number six, back to Chris Berman in New York. All right, Chris and Andrea, thank you. Uh, well, uh, judging on what Mark Malone said, and you got to think if they're going to put the money to Danelle Wolford, an excellent corner for Chicago, that this is the end of the marriage between Rod Woodson, one of the best corners when his knee was right ever. Uh, Rod Woodson and the Pittsburgh Steelers, it appears, will part company. San Francisco, as Andrea mentioned, we mentioned earlier, uh, that could be one place that he could land. But here are the Patriots, their first pick of the post parcel zero. With the uh, 29th pick in the draft, the New England Patriots select Chris Canty, defensive back, Kansas State. Next on the clock is the Green Bay Packers. Well, that was certainly one of the type of players that we were talking about, although we had mentioned Madison at that point, but, but a guy who can move, a, a defensive back. And let's make no mistake about it, Bobby Greer, I mean, he really has to say in the selection, but you like that fit, uh, Joe and Mel? I do. I, I think he's a very quick football player. I mean, you look at his abilities, first team All-American, Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year, 14 career interceptions. Not real big, but look at his quickness. See the feet? I mean, very physical for a little guy that has the ability to even adjust his face mask twice before he goes on to play. Good, good adjustment to the ball. Comes up, supports real well in the corner. A lot of little guys aren't inclined to want to do that. This little guy has the ability to do it. Again, nice job. Take out the big guy and the little guy and force the fumble. Has a lot of versatility. I like him. Even though he's a small guy, I think he has a real physical nature to his play. And again, that's what Pete Carroll likes. He likes guys who can get physical and also move on, on the defensive side of the ball. Well, an all-time record, by the way, for underclassmen that have gone uh, in the first round. As we take a look, we've never had this many guys come out early. 13. Remember, the Packers are still uh, on the clock. They could do the same thing. So 13 underclassmen here, which is why Mel in his Bible, in, in, uh, in his best-selling 1997 draft report, that's why he has not only next year's class, 
what, the sophomore class? <laughs> freshman, freshman class? The class, the eighth grade, the junior high? I saw high, a couple of seniors players in high school, I mean, too, yeah. <laughs> well, you got to let everybody, really, these kids, it trickles up. I mean, the, the young kids, they move up, so the, or the sophomores are going to be juniors. There's the kids that are going to be involved in next year's draft, potentially, and you have to let the fans out there know who these guys are early. Certainly, when you look at Chris Canty, the pick for by New England, one of the more confident players in this draft, and as you mentioned, when you're small, you better run well. This took his third 40 time during an individual workout to get under 4-5, and that's what allowed him to move from maybe an early to mid two into the uh, late uh, first round and be a possibility for the New England Patriots. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the defending champion Green Bay Packers are on the clock. Uh, the last time a Super Bowl champ stayed pat, didn't move up or down, was 91. Now, you're looking at the Packers' war room, and I think they would like to upgrade their defense. I think they would like to upgrade the defensive line. Mike and Ron Wolf have an interesting choice. I'm going to throw out a name that they haven't the Wisconsin fans don't know about this school. Marcellus Wiley, defensive end, Columbia. Why not? You have got first come into the league, you're at the bottom of the mountain. Football camp is the hardest thing I've ever been through. Team, coaches, media, all eyes are looking at me. Your whole body just starts getting hot. We asked some of the NFL's hottest rookies to switch antiperspirants and try degree. Body heat activated. As your body heat rises, degree releases extra protection when you need it most. As I work harder, degree works harder. This stuff really works. When your temperature rises, here it is, degree. Body heat activated degree for an extra degree of protection. Help me keep my coolness. Leonard Russell of the Chargers is one of the best I ever had. The only thing he needed to learn was discipline. I think it's pretty simple. You pay attention to your coaches, you act like a gentleman off the field, and you respect your elders. The NFL's High School Coach of the Year program salutes Don Norford as Coach of the Year. Didn't I tell you to call your father? earn their wings every day. Hooters, it's not just a restaurant. It's an adventure. <laughs> Unleash the beast. Unleash the beast. Yeah! Look, Sotica Eyewear. What do you want people to see? I want you to see a student and a teacher. See refinement. I'd like you to see me. Luxottica Eyewear. Let them see you. All right, the pack, after a, a wait of what? Of over five hours to get on the horn. The 30th pick in the final pick in the opening round. And also been waiting. Oh, my goodness, is he waiting to throw a pass here? Let's go up to Gary Danielson on the frozen tundra. Gary? Chris, really, uh, the philosophy here for the Packers is that we aren't last, we're really first. And the way they're looking at it is from now on, throughout the rest of this draft, the Packers will choose in front of the Jets. And with the track record Ron Wolf has had here in late rounds behind me, the jersey of Dorsey Levins is sitting right there, a very effective football player. Other guys like Leroy Butler, Frank Winters, Mark Chamorro have all been late round picks. And only five players on the Super Bowl team for this Packer teams were originally drafted in the first round by the Packers. An interesting dilemma for the Packers, though. They've lost a lot of speed on offense. But defensively, with Wayne Simmons and Sean Jones probably not coming back, and Randy White a little bit older, which way do you go? Remember, a year ago, John Michaels fell into their lap. Could it be someone like a Ross Verba from Iowa still sitting there that Ron Wolf uh, chooses right now? Chris? All right, Gary, thank you. The Packers have about nine minutes to make their selection. Offseason, have with you the champs this day and age. You get rated. They lost Desmond Howard, the kick returner extraordinaire. Andre Risen was in late, then gone. I mean, in later in the year, and what a job he did. Jim McMahon, well, they've, they've got Steve Bono to be the backup to Brett Favre. Ordinary Kit Jackson is going to be on, uh, on a competitor. How, heaven forbid. Um, they've re-signed a lot of guys. But I think a guy that holds the key to how they do next year is a guy they lost very early, Robert Brooks. 
All signs are that his knee is doing fine. And if he can step back, then they're okay. With, with Brooks and Antonio Freeman after the job that he did, and Don Beebe, they think they're okay there. Robert Brooks is one of the guys that holds a key how his rehab is going. Let's go to Mark Malone. Uh, let's get back to the Rod Woodson dis uh, discussion. You said if the Steelers sign someone else at corner, Rod Woodson will be done in Pittsburgh. Is it over? Well, I'm, well I don't know, Boomer. I just got off the phone with uh, Steeler personnel and, and people in the front office. They're not completely ruling out that Rod Woodson would, would not be back. Uh, they only had uh, a certain amount of money under the cap to offer this guy. Uh, I think Woodson's latest proposal was something that uh, was close to what he made in his last year of his, his uh, last deal. So obviously there's less money in the kitty. Uh, the Steelers say that they will evaluate this after the draft and they'll take a look at it. Maybe they can have him back, but certainly uh, this might spell the end for Rod Woodson in Pittsburgh. As for Donnell Wolford, a guy who's had a couple of incidents, DUI. Uh, the Steelers say that he's been checked randomly for the last, oh, three years by the NFL, and he's been clean. They don't think he's got a problem with alcohol or anything else. They believe Donnell Wolford has, uh, at least thinks he's got a bad rap. He fits into their plans. He's excited about being there, so the Steelers feel real good now. They've got a veteran quarter, and they've got Chad Scott, who fits right into their plans. Big physical guy that can separate people from the ball and tackle. So they're feeling pretty comfortable, and I think Rod Woodson at this point uh, might be on the outside looking in it'll be very interesting to see how this thing turns out boomer well it, it would be a shame as we said to mark to see rod woodson and the steelers part ways we shall see we do know as andrew reported that Danell wolford now a four-year deal with the pittsburgh steelers so i mean i talked joe about robert brooks i mean he could take a receiver here but really d-line and linebacker and, and even secondary to a lesser degree i think is where he's looking I think the D-line has really got to be the area that the Packers look at. I mean, there's age in that defensive line. Reggie White's at 35, Santana Dotson at 27, Gilbert Brown at 26, Gabe Wilkinson 25. And you say, well, geez, Joe, you got a bunch of those guys in their 20s. Well, the case is, is that Reggie White is the one that I think you have to look at moving on. If you get a shot at a good defensive lineman here, I think it's a perfect place to do it. The Green Bay Packers are in all likelihood going to be picking this far in drafts for quite a while now, at least the next two, three years, I'm figuring, so that if they can just fill in another young defensive lineman to go with those middle 20 guys, then they're ensuring the opportunities to be able to have stability there. And we know Fritz Shermer is a magician when it comes to working with defenses, and I personally think that if he can get an older, a younger guy there to replace Reggie, it takes a little bit of the pressure off what they want to do up front. Under six minutes now on the clock for the Green Bay Packers. Wayne Simmons looks like he's gone, almost definitely gone. So let's look at outside linebackers, Mel. Well, there's some good ones still available. Certainly we saw James Farrier go eighth overall to the Jets. Jamie Sharper, his teammates, good value at this point. Jason Taylor, better suited for a 3-4. Same thing with Greg Jones, more of a 3-4 outside linebacker from Colorado. Mike Hamilton, I like him as a sleeper from North Carolina a and Thomas just dropped. Singleton, Scharf, and Mitchell figure in that 2-4 area. Well, I mean, the Packers could be entertaining calls right now to see if somebody wants to come up, although to get, hey, first-round money for really a second-round kid, it, it's hard to imagine a team, unless they have one particular guy in mind to make this move. Well, that's what you want at this stage. You're looking for, I think, a great value pick. Sharper would be Sam Madison. There's some corners out there. There's Jerry Wunsch and Ross Verba. Gary mentioned Verba. Jerry Wunsch from Wisconsin's a good player. And went Michaels last year from USC. They have a lot of options. I think they're probably a little surprised that some of these good football players are still there. Well, let's check in with uh, Sterling Sharp. We're not talking uh, pack right yet. Let's talk about Chris Canning and the New England Patriots. He's the confidence, Sterling, he doesn't lack, right? Well, Chris, that's one thing he doesn't lack. And the one thing I like about him, I thought looking at all the film of the defensive backs, this guy might be the closest to Deion Sanders in believing in his overall skills. He's a guy that's not real big, but the one thing he likes to do is, is he crowds the line of scrimmage, he uses his hands very well, he's got great feet. Look at him recover. I mean, he stays on the receiver. I don't think he'll get away with that in the NFL, and he's a guy that makes plays. He throws his body around probably as well as any defensive back twice his size. And the one thing in looking at, at him all year long and watching tape is he crowds the line of scrimmage as I'm using my linebacker friend as a, as a receiver. You want to give me the line of he, scrimmage? He crowds the line of scrimmage like a Deion Sanders, and he wants to use everything in his bump and run technique because he knows he's got great feet to catch up. He understands the game of angles. And Chris, he doesn't have to come in because of the Steve Israel pickup. He doesn't have to come in and be a starter right now. But look midway through the season for this guy to push for a starting job. Well, Tommy, let's, uh, can we bring you in here now, or is it only one at a time up there on that field? <laughs> Tommy, Chris, Chris Canty um, for New England. I mean, you know that personnel very well. 
good mix for them? Well, I, I think certainly Chris Canny is a guy who will give people some coverage ability. I think that the question you always ask when you draft a corner who's a little bit undersized is, is he going to be able to be physical and be a run support guy at the line of scrimmage? I think also another thing is you look for him to go inside with his bump and run skill. I think he'll be excellent going inside to cover teams like Jacksonville's third receiver, and I think that's where they got hurt last year. They can cover the third receiver, Antonio Freeman in the slot, things like that. I don't think, you know, the Green Bay Packers get that big play from Antonio Freeman. Freeman to win the Super Bowl, Chris. All right, well, let's, uh, the Packers pick is coming in because there are a couple linebackers I would get back to you, Tommy, on that have maybe fallen a little bit farther down than they thought. Maybe that's one of the guys the Packers go for, but I'm, I'm holding out for the Ivy League here, Tom, but I, boy, tough, <laughs> tough sell in Big Ten country. Last pick in the first round. Let's go to the commissioner. With the last pick in the first round, the Green Bay Packers select Ross Verba, mm -hmm. tackle, University of Iowa. Now, the Big New York Ten, Jets are now on the clock. Good football player, Chris. I mean, you know, you're looking at a guy who can play guard, can play tackle. I think did a great job for Iowa. Probably one of the tougher offensive linemen in the draft, and certainly a guy that gives them a lot of versatility because of the ability to play guard or tackle. They went for John Michaels last year out of USC, really fortifying an offensive line with the addition of Ross Verba. Well, that ends the first round, and just if you want to look at the tote board very quickly, eight defensive linemen, six defensive backs, Five offensive linemen, Verba being number five. I like Verba as a tackle. I think he can also be an outstanding guard, but I think people kind of wrote him off as being a pure guard when he's not. His workouts were tremendous. Watch him here, number 73 at left tackle. Real quick feet, very agile for a big man, and tremendously tough. I think that's what separates him. This guy loves the battle and scrap uh, in the trenches. He loves that kind of warfare, and, uh, and he played a lot of good football at the University of Iowa against some tough Big Ten opposition. Ross Verba to me is a guy that at this stage of the first round is a heck of an addition to a Green Bay Packer football. You see Cedric Shaw, all-time leading rusher in Iowa Hawkeye history. Ross Verba had a lot to do with Cedric Shaw's great success at the University of Iowa. Gary Danielson doing our Big Ten games all year long on, uh, on ESPN saw Ross Verba early and often. Uh, you like that match for the Packers? Uh, you know Verba pretty well, Gary. I think it is a good match because I think what uh, Mike Holmgren and Ron Wolf were looking for was a guy who could play a number of different positions on that offensive line. And if you look back into the film work on Ross, you'll see that he had to block guys like Simeon Rice all, all through the Big Ten and match up against Finkus and Vrabel. He's had been challenged by good players and he's been able to come through. He's a good run blocker. He pulls well, and he gives them that flexibility on the offensive line that uh, maybe a guy like a Jerry Wunsch didn't have. Wunsch more of a masher maybe fits into some systems that a Ross Verba in this uh, West Coast offense maybe doesn't exactly match up. So for the pick here in Green Bay, I think it's a good match. Chris? Well, it's the first time, Gary, that a Super Bowl champ, a defending Super Bowl champ, has stayed put since 91. That was the New York Giants defending their Super Bowl title. Bill Parcells was gone by the time they made that pick. Bill Parcells is on the clock next. Well, the Jets already tabbed. James Farrier in the first round now have the second round. There are many types of athletes for them. Tonight on ESPN2 and our draft coverage continues after 7. Keyshawn Johnson will talk to him live. Peyton Manning, his decision to stay in school. Keyshawn and the effect that he's had on the team picking now. The New York Jets with one year in the league, one book out. But the more on that a little bit after 7, and I'm sure that'll be an intriguing discussion. He's good enough to talk with us live at that point on ESPN2. Second round, best available athletes, Mel. Do we dare? Use that phrase in this day and age of the salary cap. In the second round, you can start to do that. Well, right? I say the best available football player, Chris. And we have Corey Dillon. He's there now at 33 for the New Orleans Saints. Jamie Sharp would be a nice addition to the Baltimore Ravens. Marcellus Wiley would be a nice addition to anybody. I think he's going to be a steal as a defensive end. Denson and Neal are outstanding pure guards. And Wunsch, a solid right tackle. 
When you look at Jason Taylor, 3-4 outside backer, Sapp came on strong as a senior. Will Blackwell heads up my underrated list. Tucker will be a steal because he's coming off that knee injury. He's working his way back to 100%. Mack, a pure safety. McLeod, a run-stuffing inside linebacker. So a lot of quality in round two available. And, of course, when you get into extra selections in two, three, and four, that's where teams can really do some serious damage. Well, in the first round, Bill Parcells took Farrier. Could he take his teammates sharper? We'll see. The uh, pick is already up, uh, we understand, to the podium. And we'll get a chance to have the Jet fans swing back in action here at a home game. Let's go to Gene Washington at the podium. First selection overall, the New York Jets select Rick Terry, defensive tackle from North Carolina. Atlanta's on the clock. Well, he stayed in the ACC, Mel. That's what he did. Well, he did. We talked about Terry for Philadelphia. 300-pound defensive tackle. Certainly a guy who was very consistent. I didn't see a lot of upside. He's not a great natural athlete. Did a good job, though, at North Carolina controlling the middle. Like I say, he's a 305-pounder. Very experienced. Certainly benefited last year and the year before from Marcus jo Two years ago from Marcus Jones. This year he had Greg Ellis, a fine junior, to work in to that defensive line and help him out. He doesn't quit. He's a hustler. And he will in the middle of that line is a 305 pounder do a job, good job controlling things against the run and helping out your middle linebacker. All right, the cheering is here as if the Jets, uh, well, a moment ago, won the Super Bowl. Down at uh, Hofstra, let's go to Sal Palo Antonio. Uh, surprises there to you? Oh, no, definitely not a surprise. I think when Bill Parcells traded the number one pick, it was clear that he wasn't going to get Darrell Russell, didn't want to get pay Darrell Russell that $7 million signing bonus at the top, didn't think it was worth it, that somewhere along the line in the second or third round he was going for a defensive tackle. If he started the day thinking that Rick Terry was going to be available with that first pick in the second round, he knew it was going to be an awesome day for him. So I think they're very happy to get Rick Terry in this spot. They're probably very surprised that the Philadelphia Eagles didn't take him with a 22nd pick, actually with a 25th pick after they traded with the Dallas Cowboys. Now let's go to Chris Fowler in the studio in Bristol. Sal, thank you. We've got uh, Ron Jaworski and Mike Gottfried here. The guy's the fifth defensive lineman out of the Atlantic Coast Conference. Rick Terry, a guy that you frankly like a lot better than Mel did in that description. Well, I like him better than Russell. I really do. I think really? he's the best defensive tackle. I think New England's got a steal here. He's six foot four, 305 pounds. He gives you a push up the middle. The thing about him when you watch him on film is he gets off blocks, and that's what you want a defensive lineman to do, to get off blocks. He'll bull rush you. He'll spin. He'll slip. Well, he doesn't have many weaknesses. You like him better than Daryl Russell, the player that's taken second said, overall that's, by the Reds. That's, but that's a said, surprise because he's not going to cost. Uh, <laughs> he, he's the bargain of the draft. I tell you, he's a good football player. What, what about him and the scheme in the Jets? Well, he can, he's going to fit in very nicely. When you look at their first round pick as well with James Ferry, you've really got two impact defensive players coming out early. And you look what the, the Jets will play defensively, the 4-3 alignment, and you look on the outside, and this would be James Ferrier, or it could be James Ferry over here. This is a guy that is very strong at the point and can play him space out at this position. But you combine that with the Rick Terry, who could be in this position over 300 pounds to clog up the middle, the Jets are a better defense because of these two guys right now. If he's even close to the player that Darrell Russell can be when Darrell Russell's at his best, and let's face it, you talk to opponents of him, and they'll tell you Darrell Russell one play is blowing up a guard and destroying a ball carrier. The next two plays, he's on roller skates moving backwards. Every coach thinks you can push a button and get a guy to play every down. We'll have to see if they can do that to Darrell Russell because he's had a, he has a tremendous upside and Graveyard, former teammates. The graveyard is full of guys with potential. Ooh. But you think Rick Terry is more than potential. He's been Rick steady Terry has and consistent great potential. already. I think he has great potential. He goes to the Jets with pick number 31 who beef up their defensive line once more. Draft coverage continues from New York and here in Connecticut. Well, with the second pick of the second round, we are back in New York at the 62nd annual selection meeting. And the Atlanta Falcons have taken defensive tackle Nathan Davis from Indiana. Mike Ditka, the New Orleans Saints on the clock. Baltimore after that, Detroit after that. And uh, he's relinquished the uh, job at the podium. He's joined us. Uh, the commissioner of the National Football League, Paul Tagliabu, thank you for joining us. Good to be here. It's like a ball game here. I mean, especially Jets, Giants. I mean, now it's quieted down a little bit, but I mean, it, just think of what the draft used to be. A little agate in the newspaper. Now it's, I mean, this is new attendance records every year, plus the set behind it. It's quite a scene. 
Well, it's a great scene, you know. It's, it's the bridge to the next season. It's the connection between college football and the NFL. From my own personal perspective, to have these young players here, it, it's, it's one of the highlights of the year. Well, talk about young. We had a couple teams last year, Carolina Panthers and Jacksonville Jaguars, who did things differently, but yet in the second year, each were one step away from the Super Bowl. A, that gives hope to everybody. B, it, it upset a lot of the, the old 28, if you will, feeling that they had twice as many draft picks in the two drafts that they had. And they said, well, wait a minute. Next time, if we do expansion, we got to change the rules. Are they, are they fair in crying foul? Uh, I don't think so. You know, everyone likes to win, and everyone likes to figure out why they, they couldn't win. But uh, both those teams did outstanding jobs in selecting players. They, they, in some cases, signed players that were available to everybody, but they were the ones that went after them. The extra draft picks enabled them to catch up with what other clubs had in prior years. So overall, I think it was a good system, and it rewarded the fans who supported expansion to those areas so strongly. You may have to expand uh, in 1990. You have to have a team in Cleveland one way or the other. It's a two-part question. Expansion first. Cleveland guaranteed, right? Exactly. And Los Angeles, you hope soon, someday. Is that an expansion? When does the league have to decide an existing team might move or we definitely have to expand and could you do just one in 99 well first of all as you say we are committed to having the Browns back mm -hmm. on the field in Cleveland 99 they'll be there expansion versus a relocated team we hope it can be expansion we want to keep teams where they are we're going to look at that next year and we can make a decision as late as uh, the fall of 98 for a 99 team and have that team up and running in 99 we may have to do some staffing at the league level do some planning and then just come in and Get it, get it up and running, hopefully as successfully as the two, two teams you just mentioned. Seattle is, is a story that we talked about earlier, and it would be foolish for us to speculate, A, how a vote in the House, uh, the Washington legislature will go on Monday, B, how a vote to the people would then go, perhaps, for a stadium. Paul Allen has said he's gone. I mean, he's made it clear that he, he will not exercise his option July 1 if he doesn't get the bonding or the funds necessary to build a stadium. Is football in deep trouble at that point in Seattle, Commissioner? Well, I don't want to get to the deep trouble okay. because I think we have a good opportunity this weekend to solve a problem that a lot of people have worked real hard to solve. Paul Allen stepped up to the plate to mix sports. Uh, he's made a tremendous investment. You saw it today. Two picks in the first six in this draft. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is really the last chance. If it doesn't get done this weekend, if the House doesn't do what the Senate up in Washington did, we're going to be back in the tunnel with uh, no light at the end. Houston they're still in limbo aren't they do they go to Tennessee this year do they play in Houston when, when does that have to get decided and what do you see happening there well we've been trying to get that resolved in the last couple of weeks and uh, I think it should be resolved uh, they should be in Tennessee this year so that Houston and all the NFL fans in that area can get on with planning the future right now we're still focused on the past there's recrimination to some extent there's indifference it's not good for anybody and uh, least of all for the fans in Houston you're not sure. I mean, there's no timetable. It has to be done no by No timetable right now. Uh, people are working on it. Bud Adams has been working on it. I've been in conversations with people in Houston, including Judge Eccles, who, who's been very positive there, the county executive, trying to set some goals for the future instead of clinging to the past. I know you pretty well, and I think I can say that, that if not the league, then you were a little bit embarrassed by, and we were reminded this week with the Jackie Robinson baseball celebration, um, that there were 11 head coaching changes this last year in the NFL. None of those jobs uh, went to, to black coaches. Not only didn't they go, it doesn't appear that anyone other than Emmett Thomas had a couple of serious interviews. Uh, embarrassed, maybe, obviously cause of concern. What can the league do about this? You can't tell someone who to hire, but yet it's not the way to go, is it? Well, I would say cause for concern, yes. No embarrassment. Let's face it, the coaches who were hired are outstanding coaches. Nobody has to make any excuses for people like Mike Ditka, Dick Vermeil, and so on. But cause for concern because of the process. Uh, there were not enough candidates, deep enough candidates in the pool. Uh, we're working on that. We've made a lot of progress in the last decade with African-American coaches, upward mobility. We need to make more. We're setting some goals. We had a good meeting with a great cross-section of outstanding coaches who spoke well for minority coaches and for coaches generally in the NFL. So by this time next year, I hope that some new goals have been not only set, but met. A couple of meetings you had, right? Some with established names and some with names that the public really may not know. Some young up-and-coming Afro-American coaches. 
Well, that's true. You know, uh, Ray Sherman was, mm -hmm. was one of the coaches in the group, and uh, Dennis Green was involved in working with me to make the meeting constructive. But we had other young coaches, Clarence Shellman from mm -hmm. Seattle, uh, Gerald Carr from the Eagles, and others uh, who really were positive in the meeting, both about the league and what we can do to do better in the future. Everybody talking capital. We didn't see the movement that we thought last night that we would see in the first round. Are, are you, you know, in a couple of years, that, that has to be explored again. Are you concerned that some teams are saying, my goodness, we can't draft where we are because salary cap doesn't allow us, or is that really just a few teams barking? Well, you know, you know as well as anyone, there's a lot of tactics here. There's a little bit of uh, shake and bake in the draft. Uh, people are playing the chess game, and uh, I think the system is working well in terms of competition on the field. We had a terrific season last year. We're looking for another great one this year. There's some financial problems, but this... Uh, Trading down is something that's always been part of the draft. Mm -hmm. And as Bill Parcells put it, volume is important in addition to quality. When you can get both, then you're building your team. Now he's done this before, so of you. Nice to see you. Good to see you. The commissioner handled, uh, except for a slight mic problem, with the plum up there. Uh, we move on in the second round. We will continue from here at the theater in New York in a moment. Thank you, Chris. The Michelin X1, with a six-year unlimited mileage tread life warranty, gives you better wet traction than any rain tire, plus Michelin confidence in most driving conditions. Because you don't just cover a lot of miles, you cover a lot of weather. I've seen every card there is, thousands of cards. Super 8's VIP card. It says, congratulations, your reservation is guaranteed, and you get 10% off. <laughs> Life's great at Super 8. It has arrived, the day when you stop listening to the tales of other lives lived and begin the odyssey that will be your story. When you find the destiny to which you were born, all you need to bring with you is your honor, your courage, and your commitment. It's your journey. Make it a good one. Call 1-800-USA-NAVY. Let the journey begin. Hey, Brett. These guys have a beer menu. This beer is made with lingonberries. Ooh, and this one has a dash of espresso. Aura of forbidden coconut. Two cores. Since 1873. Original Coors. Pure and simple. Peach medley. You see this? This beer has beer in it. The 97 Mazda 626LX Sports Sedan. Lease for two nineteen. Add an automatic, and the lease goes to. Add power, everything, and the lease cruises to. Add air and a sweet sound system, and the lease rolls to. Add the best basic warranty in its class, and you get the idea. Lease or buy seventeen five ninety five. Ends April thirtieth. The second round roars on here at uh, the 62nd annual NFL draft. Let's get you caught up here. The last pick of the first round, in case you missed it, was the Packers guard, Ross Ferber from Iowa. Rick Terry began the second round, shaken by the JETS Jets, 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 defensive tackle, North Carolina. Nathan Davis, defensive tackle, Indiana, to Dan Reeves in Atlanta. Then Rob Kelly, safety, Ohio State. Another Buckeye goes, he goes to New Orleans and Mike Ditka. Jamie Sharper, a guy that a lot of folks had in the middle of the first round, linebacker Virginia, goes to Baltimore, and Juan Roque, one of the main uh, uh, men uh, involved protecting Jake Plummer at Arizona State, he goes to Detroit. The Giants are on the clock now, followed by Tampa Bay. Jamie Sharper, good value for the Ravens, Mel. Great value. If you remember, if the Ravens would have made that trade with the Giants to drop down to seven, they would have taken James Farrier. Now they get his teammate, but only in the early second round. And it's a great value pick for the Baltimore Ravens. Desperate for some outside linebacker help. This kid is a true 4-3 outside linebacker. Really a very productive play. See, 435 career tackles. You watch him here, number 33. Really early in his career, he probably had a higher rating 
rating than Farrier. And even at times this year, we had another higher rating than James Farrier. But kind of, you know, slid down just a little bit. Spends a little time, too much time on the ground for some clubs liking. But overall, just a very good, very productive outside linebacker. Very experienced in pass coverage and getting after people to the flanks. Rick Lance, of course, and I can't give him enough credit for the development of Farrier and Sharper. Coach these guys very well. Turn them loose a little more this season. Let them get after the quarterback. So I think uh, Ted Marchipro and the Ravens are getting a multi-dimensional outside linebacker that should be, just like they hoped Farrier would be if they would have had him. This kid, Sharper, could be a starter right away on the outside in a 4-3. Let's uh, whip around to a couple of our insiders. Let's start with Sal Palantonio at Jets headquarters at Hofstra. Sal? Well, I think as Mel said, Boomer, uh, Shar uh, Farrier and Sharper are two picks uh, that everybody expected to go in the first round. And I talked to Ozzie Newsom, the vice president of, of uh, director of personnel and relations for the Ravens, and he said that they would really love to get uh, Sharper if they could, and they got him, and they really need help at outside linebacker. They cut Kroll, Gerald Williams, and Mike Caldwell uh, both were hurt a lot. Don't forget they went back for a 3-4 to a 4-3 and experimented a lot, and Benny Testaverde had a career year at quarterback, but the defense is ranked last in the league in just about every category, so they really had to upgrade their defense, and with these two players, Peter Boulware, and uh, Jamie Sharper, they have done that. Now let's go to Chris Mortensen in Miami. Well, Sal, the other New York team, the Giants, I think they're considering a very interesting pick here. I think they're considering Tiki Barber, the Virginia running back. Even though they have Tyrone Wheatley and Rodney Hampton, Jim Fossil wants a third down back, and Tiki Barber caught 66 passes in his career at Virginia. They were so high on uh, Tiki Barber, I was told this morning he was actually a first-round consideration for the Giants. It'll be interesting to see if Fossil continues uh, to convince George Young that he can go offense to surround Dave Brown, Dave Brown with players like Ike Hilliard and like Tiki Barber who can catch the ball. Chris Berman in New York. All right, Mort, thank you. And let's, uh, let's look at the Ravens for a moment who, uh, A, find themselves uh, in an up-and-coming division. Of course, Jacksonville is up and come. Uh, Pittsburgh has been there. Houston and Cincinnati on the move. But Baltimore, boy, they had a great year with Vinny last year, yet they couldn't hold the lead. Now they got Bullware. And now they have Sharper, so they're addressing, obviously, their need. Right, Jacksonville really up and went past right. everybody else, Boom, that's exactly right. Baltimore winds up putting Vinny Testaverde in the Pro Bowl. He winds up throwing 31 touchdown passes. But look at the rankings, 30th in total yards, 30th in passing, um, points a game, 28, takeaways, 28, sacks, 25th. I mean, this is a football team that just wasn't very productive on the defensive side of the football. The other big problem that they had is even when they had leads, and they had a number of them going into the fourth quarter this past year, they weren't able to keep them. The offense couldn't carry them. I think this is an area where they, with Ted Marchero, it feels like they had to focus on. Obviously, they have. Well, we just had a pick, uh, um, and personally, one of my favorite players in the draft. My favorites, the guys I was watching, I mean, we like a lot of them. Wiley, we talked about at Columbia. Jake Plummer, Arizona State, love him. And Tiki Barber, a, a guy who's not that big, the Giants just took him uh, running back from Virginia, but boy, he runs tough. Well, he does, Chris. He's up to about 195 pounds and on 200 area at times. He was only 170 early in his career. Tremendous productivity. A great punt returner. Also averaged 12.7 yards per punt return. Look at the elusiveness and the breakaway speed. You don't see a lot of differences between Tiki Barber and Warwick Dunn. Very creative runner. Good change of direction ability. Shifty. A guy can be, I think, an outstanding pass receiver. Down the field. Catch the football and do some damage. So he's going to fit in very well with Jim Fassel. Runs hard. Tough kid and tremendously versatile when you factor in that great ability as a punt returner. Against Florida State during his career, Tiki Barber came up big every time. So it didn't matter the competition in the ACC. Tiki Barber was consistently productive. He'll be very good in Jim Fossil's offense. Certainly, uh, you know, filling in where with you work done would have. Now they get that guy in the second round. Well, a chance of George must go a little bit because the fans don't understand. I mean, the Wheatley and Hampton, but Barber is a different sort of player. And again, we're talking about helping out Dave Brown. By the way, four guys from the Virginia Cavaliers. And think about those games that Tiki Barber had, by the way, against Florida State. I mean, that, he was unbelievable, especially the game a year ago on a Thursday night. Well, we, we talked about the Giants all along, Chris. They've got to get playmakers. They've got to get playmakers. What they, what they got in Hilliard, they got a guy who can catch and run with the football. Now, all of a sudden, you have a guy for Dave Brown to get the ball out of the backfield with. 
I said this before and I'll say it again. Toughest stadium, I think, in the National Football League to throw the football in is Giant Stadium. When you've got a small third down back that can come out and make plays for you, like a Tiki Barber, gets his hands on the football and adds yards, they've got guys now where the Giants can look at putting the ball in the end zone. Plus, he becomes very vital in the red area. Most difficult place to cover people in the red area is when you get linebackers trying to cover running backs coming out of the backfield. This is where a guy like Tiki Barber, I think, can take the Giant production to a new level, one they haven't seen in quite a while, unfortunately. The Bucks are on the clock. St. Louis is next. New Orleans in the hole. Steamrolling in the second round here in New York. We'll be back. Good thing you came to Lowe's Home Improvement Warehouse because it's a jungle in here. <laughs> These aren't on. Live at the War Room at Tampa Bay where with picks in the first round at 12, Warwick Dunn and 16, Redell Anthony. So two offensive players. The next five teams, Tampa Bay on the clock now. Then Dick Vermeil and the St. Louis Rams, New Orleans, Chicago, and Atlanta. And one of the trades that uh, their second second round pick that they got uh, involved in that swap of the first round pick with Seattle. So now we're 37 to 41, Mel. Now what do we do here in New York? Well, we got a lot of quality still left, Chris. I think a lot of good football players still on the board. And I think when you look around it and who's still there and you look at Tampa Bay, they certainly have needs in the secondary. Jerry Wunsch, the big offensive tackle uh, from Wisconsin. Of course, they had great success with Paul Gruber, formerly of Wisconsin as well. Wunsch, 6'5", 328 pounds. Talked about the cornerback still. They also got look, uh, take a look at the best available players. Corey Dillon, I think yeah, he would look good in a New Orleans Saint uniform. Marcellus Wiley, of course, an outstanding pass rusher. Wunsch, like I said, would be a nice addition to Tampa Bay. Jason Taylor, he needs to go to a 314. That kind of limits the amount of teams that would be interested in Jason Taylor. We roll it to the next group, uh, Will Blackwell. Well, very underrated receiver Ryan Tucker he would have been a first but he had January 2nd he had knee surgery which is going to push him down a little bit and of course Tyrus McLeod if you're looking for a pure inside backer middle linebacker McLeod fits the bill so Tampa Bay uh, on the clock they've got about uh, a little under three minutes to go remember in the second round you have ten minutes to pick third round and beyond you have five minutes per pick uh, they were two uh, along with Seattle had a pair of first round picks and you know, Tony Dungy I know they lost 10 games again last year but this is going to be the last time they're, they're, they're not going to get uh, they're not going to have that they have a good defense and of yep. course with Tony Dungy knows what he's doing we talked offense is there a defensive slot now that he looks for as he keep loading up on Dilfer's side of the ball I think I think he's got what he wants on Dilfer's side of the ball now he looks for value now he's looking for guys who can come in play a little bit later on maybe fill in I, I think he's in real comfortable shape I mean you look at the record the first five games 0 and 5 that was partly his offensive struggles really the defense kept him in the games as little as they were in them they kept him in them then they go six and five in the back half they go from 27th to 11th 25th to 15 in points scored and or points on the defense given up and then the total 30 337 yards versus 284. All you're going to do is see Tony Dungy football teams get better. He's got to feel real comfortable now with what he has on the offensive side of the ball. Where he wants to go on the defensive side of the ball probably is where he'll go. And if you take a look at the war room, there's going to be a little activity for a change down there. I mean, they're, they're looking, they're thinking, they've got an idea what they want to do. You know, everybody's standing now. It's that time of the day. They've been sitting down for a little while. Now it's time to get up and move around a little bit. I'd like to see a little more orange, though, still. I mean, I actually go for the, like the new helmets and, and that stuff. I could have that red. It could be a little more orange. I mean, that's such a, it's a legacy of that orange football uniform in Tampa Bay history. I love the orange pants. I did. I did. I uh, love the uh, orange pants. I like the orange <laughs> pants. I, I thought the pants. But, the, I mean, look at that. It's, it's a great look. Maybe they could make the ball just a little bit more orange. That would give it just a the little The ball, pop. I don't know that they can control the ball, but there they are. I mean, yeah, kind of, there's the old uh, there's Vinny. Judy. There's old Vinny. That is a relic now, Vinny in a Tampa Bay uniform, a collector's <laughs> item. Well, yeah, save that picture. I kind of like the, uh, the, the, the the buck up there. I, I, I just really do. But I think they did okay. The, the Denver uniforms, later on, we're going to bring Tom Jackson in to discuss those <laughs> because... I don't know, very USFL-ish. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Sorry, League. sorry, Pat. At any rate, we're not discussing uniforms. We're discussing picks by the Bucks. Let's go up to the podium. Gene Washington gets the card. Is it time? 
With the 37th selection, Tampa Bay has selected offensive tackle Jerry Wunsch from Wisconsin. St. Louis is on the clock. Now, Dr. Jerry Wunsch. He is going to load up on the offensive side. I mean, you know, last year last year was basically a defensive way he went about it. Now, all of a sudden, he's going to load up on the offensive side. Well, you're getting too much value here, Joe. you got a big kid. Uh, you know, you're talking about 6'5 and a half, 328 pounds, a right tackle, very experienced. You know what you're getting. I think the fact that he couldn't play left tackle maybe pushed him in to get to the second round. Very a physical performer, a mountain of a man. I mean, it's a $20 cab ride to get around him when you're coming off the, off the corner. Certainly so, in New York. I mean, <laughs> but, I mean, this kid is very experienced in the Big Ten. I think everybody knows what they're getting. You plug him in at right tackle, he could be a big guard for you. I mean, he gives you some options there. And like I said, if he would have had some left tackle capabilities, you would have been probably looking at a mid-first rounder. So, you know, Tampa Bay, at this point in the draft, Great value. Like I said, they got Paul Gruber from this uh, same program a few years back and had great success with Gruber. They need another offensive tackle to throw into the mix. They got Jason Odom. They like him last year out of Florida. But I think Wunsch is one of the real steals right now of the draft. So Wunsch to Tampa Bay, three offensive players with their first three picks inside the first 37. St. Louis, New Orleans, Chicago, Hot Atlanta. We'll be back. time when the Rams got things going by taking the first selection overall. We begin our update whip around with Mark Malone in St. Louis. Thanks, Chris. Orlando Pace currently in the air on its way here to St. Louis. The Rams are on the clock with their final pick in this first day of the draft in 1997. They need defensive help, perhaps a defensive back. My sources say, say the phones are ringing. We'll be back with an update soon. Now let's go to Seattle and Hank Goldberg. The Seahawks wanted Sean Springs, the defensive back from Ohio State, with their number three pick in the first round. They got him. They wanted to trade up to get Walter Jones with number six. They got him. They did lose a player today. Terry Wooden, the veteran linebacker, has agreed to terms with Kansas City. Four-year deal there. Kansas City, by the way, soon to draft at number 47. They are going to be looking for a playmaker to go with the tight end, Gonzalez, they took earlier, and they think they're going to get him. Let's go to Hempstead with the Jets' Sal Palantonio. Bill Parcells in the first two rounds added two probable starters to this Jets batter defense. Virginia linebacker James Farrier and Rick Terry defensive tackle out of North Carolina, who's perhaps a steal on the defensive side of the ball at this point in the draft. Now let's go to Andrea Kramer in Tampa. The Buccaneers have fulfilled three needs on offense. In the first round, they got running back Warwick Dunn, wide receiver Riddell Anthony, and they just selected Offensive tackle uh, Jerry Wunsch, he will project to the right tackle position. After this, they feel that they can take the best player available, but they wouldn't mind getting a third cornerback. Let's go to Linda Cohn in New Orleans. First round, the Saints went offense and chose guard Chris Nioli. Second round, they went defense at 33 and chose free safety Rob Kelly. Mike Ditka loves this guy. He told me yesterday he likes a guy that can hit, that is quick, and is a leader, and Rob Kelly is all of these things. In fact, Ditka compares Kelly to a Gary Fensick, one of his former favorites with the Bears. Next up for the Saints, number 39, and guess who's still there? Corey Dillon. Now to Chris Mortensen in Miami. Jimmy Johnson and the Miami Dolphins biding their time in the war room, waiting to make their next pick at the 14th spot. They have picked Util Green, the wide receiver from the University of Miami. I think they go defense pretty much the rest of the way, uh, maybe an offensive lineman. Remember, last year they picked up three defensive starters in later rounds. This time they've got four threes and two fours. Jimmy Johnson still figures to pick up plenty of players. Now let's go to Chris Myers and the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas wanted help on offense. They got some big help. Six foot seven, 280 pound tight end David LaFleur. They traded up three spots to draft him. They may be looking at wide receiver help. Kevin Williams is unsigned and also on defense, despite being third ranked overall in the league last year. Leon Lett doesn't play till the final month of the season. Deion Sanders is doing that baseball thing, and they lost Darren Smith, the linebacker who signed with Philadelphia, as Jerry is eyeing the board in the war room. Let's go to Green Bay now and Gary Danielson. Well, the Packers ignored the obvious need outside linebacker, but they took a position that's always needed in Green Bay, good offensive linemen, especially a versatile one like Ross Verba from Iowa. But no resting here. Ron Wolf is back to work in the war room as he prepares for the Packers' second choice. Let's go to Bristol now and Chris Fowler. All right, thanks, fellas. I'm back with Ron Jaworski. 
Your old coach, Dick Vermeil, who you played under uh, for six years at Philadelphia, was on the clock, but the Rams, who, of course, traded up to get Orlando Pace with the first pick, reducing that total number of picks they had in the draft. They started with 10 before that trade, had to give away three picks, have now traded down. Well, when you look at the Rams, you look at Dick Vermeil, the one thing you have to understand is Dick Vermeil understands the college football player. He's been doing the games for ABC. You know, he went in on Wednesday for a Saturday game, talked to the coaches, talked to the players, and the coaches will give Dick Vermeil information because he was always very positive when he talked about coaches, mentioned the coordinators, mentioned uh, the fine players and all the things that they have done. So Dick Vermeil, in my opinion, has an inside track to the quality, particularly in the later rounds. He waited 14 years to make that draft pick coming uh, after his retirement from the Eagles. It was the Eagles rock group that had a 14-year hiatus. They came back successfully. He's got the veteran assistant coaches. A lot has been made about that and their ability to relate or not relate to younger players. Your thoughts on that? Well, no question. Dick Vermeer learned a lot from those 14 years away from the game. And he brought with him some of the finest assistants in all of football, guys that were head coaches. And you look right there at Bud Carson, Jerry Rome, Jim Hannafin, Mike White, Dick Corey, Frank Gantz, all very special, talented uh, coaches now working as assistant coaches. These guys have the ability to get the job done. And one thing Dick Vermeer will do, he will become an executive head coach. He will let this talented group coach their positions. They, of course, don't have that third round pick or did not have it before this deal. So the next pick coming up, number 40, as they trade down with the Bears, who will now make the next selection as we continue our ESPN draft coverage right after this. Yeah. Stand by to roll your break in four, three, roll your break. Elected Brett Favor, quarterback, Southern Mississippi. So Atlanta gets a favor by selecting Brett Favre from Southern Mississippi. In his lone season in Atlanta, Favre played in only two games, spending most of his time on the sidelines. In 1992, Atlanta did Green Bay a big favor, trading Favre for a first-round pick. He made his first start week four and has started ever since. An amazing 77 games in a row with a 50-27 and 27 lifetime mark. He was named the NFL's MVP the past two seasons. And last year, Favre guided the Packers to a 35-21 Super Bowl victory over the New England Patriots. And we are back in New York. <sighs> Hi. <laughs> Let's Welcome get you back. updated. This is wonderful now. Let's uh, get you updated now on uh, what's happened. We've had a trade in the second round between the Chicago Bears. Remember, only they and San Diego uh, did not have first-round picks. That's why you haven't heard from them. But the Bears picking 40 move up to 38 just to go two slots. But they get a tight end who they like, John Allred from USC. And in exchange, uh, the Rams go back two picks. So we'll hear from them after the Saints who are on the clock. And they pick up a six just for the courtesy of letting the Bears go up two slots. Well, a uh, guy who knows about moving up and down in the draft, certainly in our sprint video conference now on the line from Charlotte is uh, the general manager of the Carolina Panthers, Bill Polian. And Bill, uh, top of the evening to you. Hi, Boomer. How are you? Good. Uh, you, uh, you had to be shocked, Bill, uh, when Ray Carruth fell that far down. I mean, I, I didn't think you had that figured that he would fall through that many cracks. Am I correct? No, we didn't. Uh, we were very uh, uh, surprised that he lasted that long, uh, Chris. And uh, uh, you know, that when you're picking 27th, you want to try and get the player that gives you the best opportunity to get value for the pick. And uh, we we felt that uh, boy, we were very fortunate to have Ray there at the time we picked. I mean, speed is something you had a little with Rocket. Mushin Muhammad is, is is fast for a guy his size, but. But I mean, this it can add a whole nother dimension to to your offense. Uh, am I right? Yes, he really does. Uh, we we said a goal for ourselves entering this draft. We said we really need to improve our team speed. And of course, we lost Willie Green to free agency uh, through free agency to Denver. And uh, so this uh, not only fills that hole, but it gives us an opportunity to add a player who's uh, uh, very fast and has great return skills. So it upgrades our special teams as well. Well, I figure now in, in rounds, I mean, everything being equal, you, you, I mean, you have some players who had just marvelous seasons, but guys uh, getting long in the tooth, uh, like a Sam Mills, like all the ex Saints, really like a Maxi, and we could go on and on and on. Is that where you're probably looking to fill in at this point? And is there good value down at the bottom of second and third, et cetera, for those type of players? 
Well, we really feel there's good value still uh, uh, on the board. A lot of players that we have interest in, and we wouldn't limit it to defense alone. Uh, we, we, we're going to try and pick the best player that comes up on our board. When you're down in the, in the, the low 20s, that's what you need to do. And uh, we still like a lot of the players that are up there, so we're hopeful a good one will get to us in this round and in the third as well. Were you surprised with some of the moves and really non-moves after all that was talked going into today? I don't mean the moves earlier in the week, but uh, how the top of the draft went. Were there uh, some things that surprised you a little bit? Well, I, not many surprises, really. I thought that uh, Tampa Bay did a great job of maneuvering around, and the Jets have done a great job improving themselves on defense. Uh, but I think it went pretty much as people thought. Bill. You are now the hunted after only two years. Uh, <laughs> division champs, um, you know, Monday night football at home against the 49ers, uh, probably hunted in the free agency role now, uh, kind of turning the tables. Uh, in your wildest dreams, did you think this would happen this fast? No, I really did not. And it's a great tribute to uh, Jerry and Mark Richardson and John Richardson and Dom Capers and his coaching staff for uh, taking a team that. Uh, uh, didn't know each other uh, two years ago at this time and, and turning them into uh, NFC uh, West champions. And you're right, we have a tough road to hoe and uh, a long way uh, to go if we want to get back to uh, uh, the championship game and hopefully beyond. But one thing I know, we got a great organization, great ownership, and a great coaching staff, and they'll get the maximum out of the players we have. Bill, I asked Tom Coughlin a similar question before. If you can disassociate yourself for a little bit, by the man that, that made the trade to get Kerry Collins in and then watch him progress and as leader of a team that now moved on to the championship game. Are you excited as a football guy to watch a Kerry Collins progress and what he can do in leadership and quarterback abilities in the next year or two or four or five? Absolutely, Boomer. Uh, uh, Kerry still has a long way to go before he reaches uh, his full potential. He's just beginning to scratch the surface of his ability. Uh, he improved to uh, uh, virtually an 80% passer this past year, but he can do a lot better than that. Uh, his, his leadership, his toughness is evident, but uh, as his uh, experience in big games and uh, in the stretch drive and in, uh, in the quest for a championship grows, he'll become a much, much better quarterback. So uh, he's in here working now in the offseason with Joe Pendry, and, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, further big strides from Kerry Collins. And he'll be helped with back of a two, et cetera. You had a couple of years where you didn't do this, but now you are the guru of the late pick in the round again. So <laughs> you're back into your, uh, your natural habitat. Go get him. <laughs> thank you. All right, Bill, thank you very much. Bill Pulliam, one of the very best at, at what he does and witness uh, the Carolina Panthers in two years to the championship game. So he goes back into the war room. They're not till later in the round. New Orleans has uh, made the pick. Let's go up to Gene Washington. New Orleans, with their selection from Oakland, selects defensive end Jared Tomich from Nebraska. Mel, this is the time of the draft when uh, we really uh, turn to our right and say, okay. Well, this is a kid who had a great junior year and then he decided to go back to Nebraska. Didn't play particularly well at times this year. In fact, in the opener against Michigan State, he was neutralized by Flozell Adams, who we'll be talking about here next year, an offensive tackle with the Spartans. The guy with Thomas, though, he gives you a great effort. And I think that's what Mike Ditka has been stressing. He wants tremendous intensity. He wants guys going to work hard. Certainly, Nioli will do that. Rob Kelly, who we got at the 33rd spot to safety from Ohio State, the same type of player. And Tomich, yeah, he's, he definitely slid down the draft board this year. Uh, actually, would have gone higher had he come out last year. But in terms of what Ditka said he's looking for, he at least gives you that hardworking mentality. He's going to be good in the locker room. He's going to upgrade the intensity level of your defensive football team. Well, the uh, Saints have picked Tomich. Let's go down to uh, New Orleans right now and join our Linda Cohen. Linda? Chris, thank you. Yeah, Jerry Tomich getting a big run stopper. I talked to Mike Ditka yesterday, and that's what he said. That was a very, very important key. He had problems with that. And this Saints team is going to undergo major changes on defense, on that line. Ronaldo Turnbull, for instance, he's going to be asked to switch to strong side linebacker. Many changes going on there. And uh, Willie Broton, he's getting up there in age, so they're concerned about the age factor, and they want to add to this depth. So this is no shock. Chris, back to you in New York.
All right, Linda, thank you. So the uh, Mike Ditka has made his choice. Now St. Louis uh, gets the pick in the second round, having picked up that extra six for letting the Bears go up a couple. St. Louis, Atlanta, Arizona, Cincinnati, and Jimmy Johnson and the Miami Dolphins. We'll be back.